Considering that the video game industry is now over 50 years old, if you count Pong as the point where it all started, then it's really not surprising that it's given us gamers plenty of big moments that have stuck in our collective memories. But have you ever sat down to wonder which ones are the most iconic? We certainly have, and it's for this reason that we've decided to bring you today's big list. To help us pull this list together, we went out amongst our wonderful community with a simple question. What are, in your opinion, the most unforgettable moments in gaming history? Well, you turned out in droves to give your thoughts, so many in fact, that our original plan to list the 101 most unforgettable moments both real world and in game has been thrown out of the window. And we've decided instead to create two separate lists, starting with the most iconic in-game moments. Every entry on this list is something that's happened in one of our favourite games that has stuck with us long after the credits have rolled. They can be as small as a single quote, or as big as the death of a beloved character, but what matters is that they've stayed on our minds and in our hearts in the years since their respective games release. As is always the case with these big lists, we must establish some rules. First off, we want to make it very clear that, as with the case with our 101 video games that everyone should play at least once list, these entries are in no particular order. What that means in practice is that the entry in the number one spot is no more or less meaningful than the entry in the number 101 spot. Secondly, in order to prevent repetition, and to ensure that we've got as diverse a view of the whole of gaming history as possible, we've decided to limit proceedings to one entry per game. Where you guys suggested multiple options for the same title, we've gone with our guts and picked the moments that we think stand out the most. Finally, a massive spoiler warning is in effect from here on out. Because of the very nature of this list, this is unavoidable as we will be covering major plot points, twists, and character deaths. You know, the unforgettable moments. With all that hopefully nice and clear, I'm Ben. I'm Peter. And I'm Ashton from Triple Jump, and here are the 101 most unforgettable moments in gaming history. Number 101. The Identity of Darth Revan, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic These days, the twist at the end of Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is probably one of the worst kept secrets in gaming. It is to video games what Bruce Willis was dead the whole time is to movies, but that doesn't stop it from being completely iconic. Released in 2003 exclusively for PC and Xbox, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic tells the story of the player character's fight to defeat the Sith Lord Darth Malak. Set some 4,000 years before the rise of the Galactic Empire, KOTOR takes place in the time shortly after the Mandalorian Wars. At the behest of Jedi Knights Revan and Malak, the Jedi become involved in the war and the Republic emerges victorious. Revan and Malak then disappear for a year before returning as Sith Lord and Apprentice respectively and invading the Republic themselves. After Revan is seemingly killed by the Jedi, Malak succeeds his former master and begins his own campaign of terror. The game opens with the player character awakening aboard a Republic ship which is under attack from Malak's forces. After crashing on the surface of Taris, the player embarks on a quest to find a Jedi and acquire more information about the Star Forge, the source of Malak's military resources. After journeying to a number of planets, the player is ultimately captured by Darth Malak, who reveals that, shock horror, the player is an amnesiac Darth Revan. Q gasps, screams, fainting, and many other visceral reactions from players. Truly an iconic twist. Number 100. Waiting for Pagan Min. Far Cry 4. This one's a bit of a strange entry to tell you the truth, as not everyone who played Far Cry 4 will have gotten to experience it. Those who have, though, will know exactly why we've decided to put it on our list. This particular moment happens right at the beginning of Far Cry 4's runtime. Players take control of RJ Garley, a man who travels to the fictional country of Kiryat in order to unite his mother's ashes with his sister's shrine. Unfortunately for him, his bus is attacked by the royal army and RJ and his tour guide are kidnapped by Pagan Min, king of Kiryat and antagonist of the game. Should RJ flee Min's mansion while his tour guide is being interrogated, then the game proceeds as planned. RJ will become embroiled in the civil war that has broken out in the country and will ultimately learn of his family's history. However, if he waits patiently, as instructed by Min, Pagan will return to the table, thank RJ for being a gentleman, and then lead him to his sister's shrine to place his mother's ashes. After that, Min invites RJ to join him to finally shoot some goddamn guns, and then that's it, the game ends. 
This moment completely caught players off guard when the game was released, as it was a complete subversion of expectations. Usually, a game would refuse to move forward or would see the player character killed for not doing what it wanted them to, but in this instance, Far Cry 4 rewarded those who followed Min's instructions with a neat little easter egg that has to be one of the most brilliant in gaming history. Number 99. The First Liquor, Resident Evil 2 the Resident Evil series is full to bursting with horrifying monsties, both human and bio-organic, and so it was incredibly difficult for us to whittle the options down to just one per game. Resident Evil 2 and its remake in particular gave players plenty of memorable monsty moments, and we must give honourable mentions to the first time we met Mr. X and our initial counter with the Ivy, both of which gave us nightmares for weeks after. However, the Resident Evil 2 moment chosen by the most viewers was the first time that players run into a liquor. Whilst wandering the corridors of the Raccoon City Police Headquarters, both Claire and Leon can catch a glimpse of some hideous, fleshy monstrosity crawling past the windows. Rounding a corner, they'll come face to face with the liquor, one of the most terrifying creatures in the Resident Evil universe. The liquor is unlike anything that players had come across in the game up to that point. Not only can they traverse walls and ceilings, but they're also devilishly fast, vicious, damn near impossible to kill, and have long barbed tongues that they use to attack. The first time that players meet one, they're completely unprepared for it, and that's what makes it such a frightening moment. As the character panned up to reveal that hideous face, accompanied by a wonderfully tense score, every Resident Evil 2 player absolutely cacked themselves, and you're lying if you say you didn't. Number 98. Nico, it's Roman, let's go bowling. Grand Theft Auto 4. According to our good friends over at Metacritic, I swear we are very good friends even if they don't ask us to go bowling, Grand Theft Auto 4 is the third best game ever made, and so it makes sense that throughout its runtime it has a number of unforgettable moments. We could have gone with the opening credit sequence, a cutscene that's bathed in depravity and debauchery, or the game's ending in which either Cousin Roman or Kate get shot depending on the choices the player has made. However, it feels fitting to choose an infamous occurrence from the game, one that has been endlessly quoted by fans ever since GTA 4's release back in 2009. Indeed, despite knowing that his cousin is probably somewhat busy with crimes, Roman Bellic constantly hounds Nico to go bowling with him. If players take him up on the offer, they get to enjoy a nice game with a beloved family member, and will raise Roman's fondness rating in the process. Raise it high enough and Roman will give Nico free taxi rides for life. Pretty snazzy. Despite the interruption being a bit of a pain in the ass, the repeated invitations are looked back on fondly by most GTA 4 players. Fun fact, although we turned Roman's offer down more times than we can count, it still stung when we called him asking to go bowling, and he refused. I can't do it right now, Nico. Uh, maybe later? Number 97. The Unicorn. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. By and large, CD Projekt Red's 2015 masterpiece The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is a fairly serious affair. Just because its plot is sober, though, it doesn't mean that The Witcher 3 is completely without a sense of humour. In fact, one of the most iconic and unforgettable moments in the game is one of the sillier ones. During the main story quest, The King is Dead, Long Live the King, Yennefer convinces Geralt to leave the wake of Skellige's King and help her break into Ermion's laboratory and steal the Mask of Ouroboros. After a fight with a number of hallucinated animals and a real Earth elemental, the duo is able to get their hands on the mask, but their plans to return to the wake are hindered by some pretty nasty poison gas. Yen asks Geralt to think of something, and if players choose the option pertaining to kissing her, she'll teleport them to her room rather than back to the wake. As she goes to fix her ripped dress, things begin to get steamy, but rather than taking things to bed, Yen insists on climbing on the back of a stuffed unicorn, giving us perhaps the most insane yet memorable moment in the game. Just try not to think too hard about where that horn could get stuck. Number 96. There's always a lighthouse, there's always a man, there's always a city. Bioshock Infinite. The Bioshock games are full to bursting with moments that'll stick in players' minds, and I don't think it's spoiling the rest of this list too much if I tell you this entry won't be the last time this series appears. There were a number of moments in 2013's Bioshock Infinite that could have made this list, including the first time players feasted their eyes upon Columbia or the terrifying first appearance of the Songbird, but we decided to go with the quote that best summarises the game's twist ending. Now, the plot of Bioshock Infinite is somewhat complex, but I'll do my best to summarise. Throughout the game, players take on the role of Booker DeWitt, a man who is sent to the airborne city of Columbia to retrieve Elizabeth, a young woman with the power to manipulate tears in the space-time continuum and who is held captive in the city. Long story short, it transpires that this Booker is one of an infinite number of Bookers, like in the title of the game, and that depending on choices he makes, he either remains as Booker or becomes Comstock, the founder of Columbia and the game's main antagonist. 
As Elizabeth explains the endless different worlds, she tells our protagonist that many things change, but three things remain constant. There's always a lighthouse, there's always a man, and there's always a city. Although players may not have fully grasped what was going on throughout Bioshock Infinite, we can guarantee that this line has stuck with them. Number 95. The Microwave Corridor – Metal Gear Solid 4 – Guns of the Patriots there is no denying that the man, the myth, the legend, Jeff Keighley's best friend, Hideo Kojima, has had some wacky ideas over the years, but it's also impossible to deny that he's given us some of the most breathtaking moments in gaming history. Case in point, the microwave corridor in 2008's Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots. Built aboard the battleship Outer Haven in order to prevent access to the GW, the microwave corridor is a long hallway lined with weapons, which, when activated, cause severe pain to anyone within the corridor by heating up the water molecules inside their body. That's right, it does to a human being what your countertop appliance does to a bowl of soup. Ouch. Does that stop Solid Snake, though? Of course not. In order to put a stop to Liquid Ocelot's plan to launch a nuke, our good guys plan to upload a virus to GW, but to do that, someone's going to have to face the microwave corridor. Raiden puts himself forward for the task, but it's ultimately Snake who goes in. This scene is about as tense as they come, and players are forced to push Snake forward despite the fact that he's clearly in agony. The whole thing plays out alongside shots of the rest of his team trying and largely failing to hold off Liquid's Haven Troopers, and the chilling score brings it all together to stress-inducing perfection. Number 94. The Town Shifts – Silent Hill for a game that nobody, not even the devs, expected very much from, Silent Hill certainly did well for itself. Not only did it receive critical acclaim when it was released in 1999, but it spawned an entire franchise of video games, comic books, movies, and even pachinko machines. The games themselves, especially the first three, are filled with unforgettable moments, but there were two that you guys called out as being your favourites. One from the second game in the series, which we'll get to shortly, and the moment in Silent Hill where the town first shifts. The game begins with protagonist Harry Mason driving himself and his daughter Cheryl to Silent Hill for a vacation. Seriously, whoever's on that town's tourist board has the hardest job in the world. Fool this guy, though, idiot. At the edge of the town, Harry narrowly misses hitting a girl with his car, but crashes and loses consciousness. When he awakens, he finds that Cheryl is gone and must venture out into town to find her. It's not long, however, before Harry finds that not all is as it seems, and within minutes of arriving, a siren wails, the town transforms into a nightmarish hellscape, and vile creatures begin to attack. Prior to its shift, Silent Hill is an already unsettling place, but we'll never forget those feelings of dread that hit us the first time that siren went off. Number 93. Kratos' Leap from Mount Olympus – God of War as openings to video games go, God of Wars is probably up there amongst the most iconic. Released in 2005, the original God of War tells the story of Kratos, a fearsome warrior who serves the gods. Whilst facing the deadly barbarian king, Kratos calls upon Ares, the eponymous God of War, who grants Kratos the Blades of Chaos in exchange for his servitude. With the barbarian king defeated, Ares commands Kratos to lead an attack on a village populated by worshippers of Athena, but unknown to Kratos, Ares has transported his wife and daughter to the village, and he ends up killing them in a frenzy. Oh dear. He then, understandably, swears vengeance against Ares and begins serving the other gods. However, the game opens after all of this has happened. Haunted by everything that's occurred and forsaken by the gods, Kratos attempts to commit suicide by casting himself from Mount Olympus into the Aegean Sea. This opening cutscene came as a huge shock to players, and whatever they were expecting from the first few minutes of God of War, it almost certainly wasn't that. After all, Kratos was featured on the game's box art and was clearly the protagonist, so why the hell was he hurling himself off a mountain within the first two minutes of the game's runtime? As far as attention-grabbing opening cutscenes go, it really can't be beaten. Number 92. Thank you, Mario, but our princess is in another castle. Super Mario Bros. Have you ever ordered something for in-store pickup, but when you get there, they tell you that actually you've accidentally ordered your items to the store on the other side of town? Well, that's how gamers in the 80s felt when they reached the end of World 1-4 in the OG Super Mario Bros. Originally released in Japan and North America in 1985 and across the rest of the world in 1987, Super Mario Bros. tells the story of Mario as he embarks on a quest to save the Mushroom Kingdom from Bowser. After invading the Mushroom Kingdom and turning all of its inhabitants into inanimate objects, Bowser kidnaps Princess Toadstool, the only person with the power to reverse his spell, and it's left up to Mario to rescue her so that the kingdom can be restored. However, after traversing various parts of the kingdom and making it all the way through a castle, Mario is greeted by Toad who tells him, thank you Mario, but our princess is in another castle. 
Cue thousands of NES controllers being flung across living rooms all over the world as players realized that they had not, in fact, completed the game as they perhaps first thought and still had a ton more work to put in if they were actually going to save the princess. Absolute nightmare. Number 91. Arthur's Last Ride – Red Dead Redemption 2 if you're looking for a game with a real feel-good ending, then I am here to tell you that Red Dead Redemption 2 ain't it. Don't get us wrong, it's an absolutely cracking title with a gripping story, flawed but likeable characters, and some of the most stunning environments we've ever seen in a game, but a happy game it certainly isn't. Set in 1899, Red Dead Redemption 2 follows Arthur Morgan, an outlaw who must come to terms with the decline of the Wild West. Arthur is a member of the Vanderlind Gang, who decide that their best course of action is to try to obtain enough money to be able to escape the law and retire. Their leader, Dutch, becomes obsessed with the idea of doing one last heist and begins to lose his morality and his trust in his fellow gang members. Meanwhile, Arthur is diagnosed with tuberculosis and is forced to face his own mortality and what that could mean for the gang. Following a train heist in which Dutch abandons Arthur and leaves John Marston for dead, a dying Arthur makes one final ride into the gang's camp to reveal the traitor amongst them, soundtracked by the haunting That's the Way It Is by Daniel Lanois. The scene is poignant and tragically beautiful and serves as a fitting, if slightly depressing, end to Arthur's story, one that stayed with players long after the credits rolled. Peter? Number 90. Aerith's Fate – Final Fantasy VII it's been 25 years since we were forced to look on in complete horror as our sweet darling Aerith, or Aerith if you want to get different pronunciation about this, was brutally murdered by all-round knobber Sephiroth, and you know what? We're still not over it. Set on the planet Gaia, Final Fantasy VII tells the story of eco-terrorist group AVALANCHE in all caps, and their efforts to put a stop to the Shinra Electric Power Company, a megacorporation that's out to mine the planet's life essence, and Sephiroth, an emo dude with a god complex. Players take on the role of Cloud Strife, a mercenary who joins Avalanche. Along his journey, he meets a variety of different characters, including Barrett Wallace, Tifa Lockhart, and fan favourite Aerith Gainsborough. Being a sweet, lovely flower peddler, fans probably assumed that Aerith would be safe, but no. As she prays to the planet for help, Sephiroth attempts to convince Cloud to kill her, and when he won't, the blonde git leaps down from the rafters and does it himself, much to the distress of the party and everyone who played the game. Aerith's death came pretty much out of nowhere, and we can more or less guarantee that there isn't a Final Fantasy fan out there who wasn't completely devastated by the turn of events. Sephiroth does get his in the end, but it's not much consolation, and we all know that that sword is definitely compensating for something. Number 89. The End of Day 3 – The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask Prior to the release of Majora's Mask in 2000, the Legend of Zelda series was widely regarded as quite light-hearted, and whilst the games occasionally dealt with some heavy themes, they generally did so in a non-gloomy way. Then the moon fell out of the sky. Indeed, the main gameplay mechanic in The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was the three-day time loop that Link was forced to relive over and over again. If he's able to obtain the Ocarina of Time, he can return to 6am on the first day, saving much of his progress, including his weapons, maps, and collections of music and masks in the process. However, should he fail to get his hands on the ocarina, or simply forget to use it in time, then the moon will crash into Termina, destroying it, and Link will have to do everything all over again. To say that players were shocked the first time the moon crashed into Termina would be a massive understatement. Naturally, the three-day cycle premise was very well received by fans and critics, with reviewers calling it one of the most inventive gameplay mechanics in all of gaming. But that didn't prevent players from being utterly horrified by that giant, terrifying moon face as it descended upon them. Absolute nightmare fuel. Number 88. Sarah's Death – The Last of Us Part 1 as gamers, we've come to accept the fact that characters die. It's inevitable. Some characters will be pleased to see oft, whilst others will be rather upset about, and some might even shock us. 
I think it's fair to say, though, that few character deaths surprised and horrified us as much as Sarah's in The Last of Us Part 1. The game opens as the Cordyceps fungus begins ravaging the United States. Fearing for their lives, protagonist Joel, his brother Tommy, and Joel's daughter Sarah attempt to flee the chaos breaking out around them. As they try to leave town by car, they're hit by a truck and Sarah's leg is broken forcing them to continue on foot with Sarah being carried by Joel. Pursued by the infected, Joel and Sarah finally come across a soldier who guns down their attackers. Joel pleads to the soldier for help, but he turns his gun on them and fires. The pair fall down an embankment, and it looks like it's game over for Joel as the soldier points a gun in his face. But thankfully, Tommy is on hand to rescue his brother. Excellent! Everybody lives happily ever after, right? Right? Well, no, not exactly. And we, the audience, are forced to look on in horror as Sarah dies in Joel's arms from a fatal bullet wound. It's been a decade since the game was originally released, but we still ugly cry every time. Number 87. Ornstein and Smau, Dark Souls. In a game that's famed for being, how to put this, more difficult than most, you'd think it would be tricky for any one particular Dark Souls fight to stick out in the memories of players. Clearly, if you do think that, though, then you haven't had the pleasure of acquainting yourself with Ornstein and Smau Smo Smoog Smog Sm Just say, say what you like, I don't care. By the time players face Ornstein and Smo, they've already taken down some pretty ferocious foes, including the likes of the Asylum Demon, the Iron Golem, and the Chaos Witch Quaylag. Heck, it won't even be the first time they've been forced to take on two bosses at once. The Bell Gargoyles will have seen to that. Ornstein and Smo are different, though. They're not just carbon copies of one another, they are distinct enemies with their own movesets meaning the player needs to keep track of two gigantic adversaries that are each doing their own thing. Oh, and don't think you'll have an easy time by taking one down before the other. No siree, because once one of the bosses dies, the other becomes stronger. Smo gaining the power of lightning, and Ornstein growing to an immense size, but still retaining his former speed. As tough as this fight is, though, it's hugely satisfying to finally overcome the duo, and many players agree that the feelings of triumph experienced after beating Ornstein and Smo haven't been matched by a video game before or since. Number 86. Welcome to the family, son. Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. Under normal circumstances, a greeting of welcome to the family, son, would be rather innocuous at worst, if not downright pleasant. Those who've played Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, however, will know that the sentiment can have an altogether darker meaning. Released in 2017, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard tells the story of Ethan Winters and his search for his missing wife, Mia. After hearing nothing from his spouse for three years, he one day receives a message telling him to go and find her in Dulvey, Louisiana. Ethan arrives at the Baker family estate, though he soon finds that all is not well. He tracks Mia to a cell in the basement, but after freeing her, she becomes violent and cuts off his left hand with a chainsaw. No sooner has he subdued Mia than he runs into Baker family patriarch Jack, who greets Ethan with a very jump scary Welcome to the family, son. before punching his lights out. Naturally, players probably weren't naive enough to think that just because Ethan had neutralized Mia, all of his problems were over, but they probably didn't expect Jack Baker out of nowhere delivering an iconic quote and a mean right hook. Oh well, at least we all got to enjoy a nice relaxing meal with the Baker family straight afterwards, right? <laughs> Did you harvest these intestines yourself, Mrs. Baker? Number 85. White Phosphorus. Spec Ops The Line. We've talked about the White Phosphorus incident a lot on this channel over the years, but no matter how many times we revisit it, it still remains completely horrifying. When Spec Ops The Line was released in 2012, many gamers assumed it was just another America flip yeah type of shooter in the vein of the Call of Duty series. But oh, how wrong they were. Rather than simply giving players a gun and tasking them with shooting baddies, Spec Ops The Line forced its players to face the true horrors of war and really reflect on the actions of its characters. 
The game follows Captain Martin Walker and the Delta Force team as they embark on a recon mission in a sandstorm-ravaged Dubai. The 33rd Infantry Battalion had gone in to assist with the evacuation after the city's politicians abandoned the people, but quickly lost control of the situation, declaring martial law and committing atrocities against civilians in the process. By the time Walker and his men arrive, the 33rd have gone rogue, and Walker elects to go and find their commander, Conrad. Whilst attempting to advance further into the city, Delta Force team reach the gate, which they believe to be heavily guarded by the 33rd. In order to minimize their opposition, they choose to employ chemical weapon White Phosphorus. Only, it turns out it wasn't the 33rd sheltering at the gate, it was 47 evacuated civilians. Walking through the area some time later and coming to terms with what you've done was an utterly devastating moment in gaming history. Number 84. The Assassins United – Assassin's Creed Revelations now, to address the elephant in the room, no, Assassin's Creed Revelations is not the best Assassin's Creed game ever made, and it was easily the weakest of the Ezio trilogy. Still, it may have been flawed, but that didn't stop it from giving us one of the most memorable moments in the whole franchise. Released in 2011, Assassin's Creed Revelations is a direct sequel to Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, and concludes Ezio's story. The historical portion of the game follows Ezio Auditore di Firenze as he goes to Constantinople, not Istanbul, so he can obtain the five keys needed to open the vault built by Altair three centuries prior. Upon entering the vault, Ezio finds nothing but Altair's skeletal remains and a sixth key, through which he discovers discovers that the vault was supposed to house Altair's Apple of Eden, and that he sealed himself away with it to protect it. Rather than taking the apple, Ezio opts to leave it where it is, and is able to speak to Desmond Miles directly, telling him he now knows he is just a conduit for a message, doffing his hidden blade and the rest of his weapons as he does so, and indicating his intent to retire. This meeting served as a perfect poetic end to Ezio's story, and although the game as a whole might not have been the best, it's hard to deny that this scene was the perfect conclusion to the trilogy. Number 83. Gats Return – Saints Row 4 the Saints Row series is filled to the brim with big personalities, and one of many fans' favorite characters is undoubtedly Johnny Gat. First appearing in 2006's Saints Row, Johnny is brash, sarcastic, hot-headed, and self-righteous, and yet through all of that, the players still love him. Sadly, his violent tendencies catch up to him in Saints Row the Third, and whilst commandeering a syndicate plane, Johnny is killed. Still, this isn't the real world. It's video game land, which means that deceased characters aren't forced to stay that way forever. In Saints Row 4, the eponymous gang discovers that Gat is still alive, but in order to rescue him, player will need to enter his mind, which looks strangely like a 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up. It transpires that the Zin, the alien race that have destroyed Earth and placed its best and brightest into a simulation, along with those from other planets, have captured Johnny and are holding him on their mothership. Once Johnny is freed from the simulation, player must head to the Zin mothership to find his body, but upon arrival, they find a trail of dead aliens and a nude goop-covered gat stabbing a Zin soldier in the back of the head in order to reclaim his signature sunglasses. Well, that's uh, certainly one way to make an entrance. Number 82. Going to Canada. South Park, the Stick of Truth. Throughout South Park's lifespan, the nation of Canada has been the butt of many of the show's jokes. You regret this day, friend! I'm not your friend, buddy! So it's not surprising that Canada was made fun of in 2014's South Park The Stick of Truth. Upon its release, this bonkers RPG impressed both critics and players with its visual style, hilarious script, and its reverence for its source material. The game follows the new kid in town as they attempt to recover the Stick of Truth, which both of the town's warring factions, led by Cartman and Kyle, believe has been stolen by the other. Ultimately, however, it turns out that Clyde has stolen the Stick of Truth as revenge for his banishment by Cartman, and is using alien goo to create an army of Nazi zombies. <laughs> Bonkers. 
In order to stop him, Cartman and Kyle unite, but even working together, they are seriously outgunned and are forced to try to recruit the girls. They agree, but only on the proviso that the player character, Douchebag, goes to Canada to find out which of their friends is spreading gossip. In what is presumably a dig, implying that Canada is less advanced than the US, the country is presented like an 8-bit RPG complete with pixelated 2D graphics and chiptune music. As daft as the level is, it gave us players a good laugh and is an unforgettable part of a game that's famous for just how many bat plops moments it has in its runtime. Number 81. Dom Finds Maria, Gears of War 2 We've seen a great number of tragic backstories in our time here at Team Triple Jump, but few are quite as harrowing as that of Gears of War Delta Squad member Dominic Dom Santiago. Prior to E-Day, which was the day the Locust Horde launched their planet-wide assault, Dom was a family man. Heartbreakingly though, both of his children were lost when the Locust invaded, and his wife Maria fell into a deep depression and later disappeared. Although Dom does everything that he can to try and find Maria, he's unsuccessful, and by the time he locates her during the events of Gears of War 2, she's been captured by the Locust, tortured, and lobotomized. The scene in which Dom is reunited with Maria is utterly heartrending and affected players long after it was over. Initially, Maria appears to Dom as she once was, but he quickly realizes the truth. The woman he once loved is gone, and all that remains is an empty shell. As he pleads with her to remember him, and comes to terms with the fact that he'll be forced to euthanize his beloved wife, players' hearts break for him. God damn it, I just wanted to shoot some aliens and now I'm feeling things. Damn you, Gears of War 2. Damn you right to heck. Sorry, excuse my language. Someone, someone else take over, please. Number 80, The Supernova, Outer Wilds. In the past few years, the time loop genre has really taken off, with the likes of The Forgotten City, Returnal and Deathloop all enjoying critical success. Outer Wilds, not to be confused with The Outer Worlds, was one such triumphant time loop title, though most who played it will probably agree that they were caught somewhat off guard the first time the loop reset itself. Players take on the role of an unnamed character who explores a system that's stuck in a time loop, resetting itself every 22 minutes. Throughout the game, players are encouraged to uncover why this is happening, and their investigations will lead them to discover the secrets of the Nomai, a now extinct race who had colonized the solar system hundreds of thousands of years earlier. The core mechanic, along with the game's story and its numerous puzzles, won Outer Wilds an awful lot of fans, but although the secrets players uncovered and the brain teasers they solved were undoubtedly memorable, it was the first time the loop reset that stuck with them the most. You see, this isn't your standard Groundhog Day situation. The player character doesn't go to sleep just to find everything has been reset. No, no, at the end of the 22 minutes, the system star goes supernova, wiping out everything in existence. After a while, you get used to it, but it certainly comes as quite a shock on the first loop. Number 79, The Death of Eli Vance, Half-Life 2, Episode 2 Better grab those hankies again, boys, girls and others, because it's time for us to look back on yet another death of a beloved video game character. And this time, we fondly remember loving father and brilliant scientist, Dr. Eli Vance. Players first meet Eli in 1998's Half-Life, though he isn't given a name or a major role in the story until 2004's Half-Life 2. By the time the sequel rolls around, Eli is leading the resistance against the Combine forces, but is captured by the alien invaders when they attack the resistance base. Thankfully, the spectacled hunk Gordon Freeman is on hand, and Eli lives to fight another day. Sadly, Eli's luck runs out in Half-Life 2 Episode 2. At the end of the game, once the scientists have been able to close the portal trapping the Combine on Earth, Gordon, Eli and Alex all head to a hangar in order to board a helicopter that will take them to the Borealis. It feels like our heroes are on the home stretch, but before they're able to escape, a pair of advisors burst in out of nowhere, restrain them and then, much to the horror of players, straight up murder Eli. You can't just dangle victory in front of us and yank it away like that! I don't think I'll ever forgive Valve for this. I will accept Half-Life 3 as an apology though. Number 78, 343 Guilty Sparks Betrayal, Halo Combat Evolved. 
Whenever the finest first-person shooters of all time are discussed, there are a handful of titles that always get a mention. Doom, Wolfenstein 3D and Quake were all games that brought something new to the FPS table, as was 2001's Halo Combat Evolved, which is often credited as modernising the genre. Part of why Halo was so successful was its compelling storyline. The sci-fi title follows protagonist Master Chief as he and his comrades attempt to uncover the secrets of the ring world Halo. The group believes the installation to be a weapon, and that the Covenant, a group of various alien species united by a common religion, intends to use it. The Covenant aren't the only baddies in the galaxy though, and it's not long before Master Chief and co come face to face with a parasitic flood. Their release prompts the AI and caretaker of Halo, 343 Guilty Spark, to recruit Master Chief so they can activate the Halo's defences. But before they're able to do so, AI Cortana stops them, revealing that if fired, Halo would destroy all sentient life in the galaxy, which admittedly would stop the flood, but is a rather extreme way of going about it. Only it transpires that 343 Guilty Spark knew this all along, and was more than happy to activate Halo regardless, a true gut punch that has left us gamers unable to ever truly trust an AI. Alexa, you wouldn't try to wipe out all sentient life, right? Right? <laughs> Number 77, the Noon Tech Diagnostic Machine, Dead Space 2. Some moments in video games stick with players because they're so heartwarming. Others, like Dead Space's series protagonist Isaac Clarke's brush with the Noon Tech Diagnostic Machine, are only memorable because they are downright horrifying. Set on the Sprawl space station, which is built amongst the remains of Saturn's largest moon, Titan, Dead Space 2 sees Isaac Clarke once again fighting off the necromorphs who've overrun Sprawl, as well as the debilitating mental illness that has been induced by the alien markers. In in order to destroy one of said markers, Isaac needs information. Sadly, he's left his copy of Destroying Markers for Dummies in his other spacesuit. And the only alternative is as wince-inducing as they come. So that he can download the necessary info into his brain, Isaac is forced to utilise the Noon Tech Diagnostic Machine, which passes on its knowledge by means of a very large, very scary-looking needle that is plunged right through the victims, <laughs> sorry, users, I Ball. What's perhaps worse for players than looking on in horror as a beloved protagonist experiences a less than ideal trip to the opticians is the fact that they themselves have to control the needle, and doing a bad job at it results in one of the goriest deaths in video game history. Should have gone to spec savers, I suppose. Number 76, Milk Twist over a helicopter. Tony Hawk's Underground. If I was asked to choose between climbing into a futuristic machine that stabs a needle into my eye and attempting to skateboard over an airborne helicopter, honestly, I'd probably go for the eye needle. I'm more than happy to watch little digital skaters attempt the latter though, because oh my is the end result bloody cool. Released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2, Xbox, GameCube and Game Boy Advance, Tony Hawk's Underground was the fifth major instalment in the Tony Hawk franchise, and was the follow-up to 2002's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. The game retained a similar style of gameplay to its predecessors, with the main difference being the player character was a custom one, and there was a plot that tied the whole thing together. The story itself follows the player character and their friend Eric Sparrow as they become professional skaters and slowly begin to grow apart. Whilst filming in Hawaii, Eric and the player climb to the top of a tall hotel so that they can film some tricks. It's at this point that perhaps the coolest moment in video gaming history happens. See, the player character doesn't intend to commit a couple of kickflips and an ollie to film. No sir, they intend to skate off the edge of the hotel's roof and perform a muck twist over the spinning blades of a helicopter. And they do. And it's magnificent. Number 75, Kefka Destroys the World, Final Fantasy VI. Over the years, we've seen video game villains doing some real evil stuff. Murder, genocide, kidnapping and torture are all things we've come to expect from our favourite baddies, but the destruction of the world at the hands of Kefka in Final Fantasy VI took even us by surprise. Final Fantasy VI was released for the SNES in 1994, and tells the story of Terra and the numerous people she encounters after being freed as a slave. The diverse group of characters at the centre of the plot stand against the Empire, led by Emperor Gestal, who rule the world through fear. 
Alas, the Empire isn't as strong and stable as it might first appear, and Gestal is murdered by his general Kefka, who usurps him in the process. A somewhat unhinged Kefka then tampers with the world's magical balance, and pretty much the entirety of the world's surface is destroyed, leaving players and the rest of the game's characters completely dumbfounded. Now, an antagonist that wants to destroy the world is nothing new, but generally speaking, a game's heroes will intervene, often at the last minute, and stop them before any real damage is done. It's for this reason that Kefka's little manoeuvre has stayed in the memory of Final Fantasy fans for the past three decades. Honestly, never saw this one coming. Number 74, the identity of the origami killer, Heavy Rain. We come now to yet another memorable plot twist that's one of the worst kept secrets in gaming. These days, knowing that Scott Shelby, the PI that Heavy Rain players assumed was one of the good guys, was actually the infamous origami killer all along, is like knowing that water is wet, or 2 plus 2 equals 4, but at the time of the game's release, it was a real revelation. The game itself follows sad dad Ethan Mars as he tries to save his son Sean from the origami killer, a serial murderer who kidnaps young boys in order to test their fathers, drowning them should their parents fail in their tasks. Throughout Heavy Rain, players step into the shoes of four different characters, Sean's father Ethan Mars, journalist Madison Page, FBI profiler Norman Jaden, and private investigator Scott Shelby. As the story progresses, players join Scott as he allegedly attempts to track down the origami killer, and it's only at the end of the game that we find out that this hasn't been the case at all, and instead, Scott is simply attempting to tie up any loose ends that would lead to him being caught. The reveal left players shocked, horrified, and hurt in equal measure. Well, I guess that's what we get for trusting a man we barely knew. Number 73, Big Smoke's Order, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Here at Team Triple Jump, we just love our food. Heck, we've even got our own cooking show. Right, that is the way to do it. Oh, please oh, be no, careful of the other night. Oh, no, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I wouldn't want to be arrogant or anything, but I don't think it's unfair to say that we're basically Gordon Ramsay, but with fewer wrinkles. With that said, although we all enjoy a grand meal every now and then, I don't think there's a single one of us that would be able to put away Big Smoke's order from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. This absolute behemoth of a meal is ordered by Big Smoke from fictional fast food restaurant Cluckin' Bell, and consists of two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, a number seven, two number 45s, one with cheese, and a large soda. Now, admittedly, three of these items are meant for Smoke's companions, but that still leaves a number nine large, a number seven, two number 45s, and a large soda for the man himself. Dedicated fans of the game have come to the conclusion that Smoke ends up with a fillet burger, two foul burgers, a foul wrap, plus a whole load of chips and a drink. As kids, we were very jealous of the order, but as 30-somethings, we can feel our arteries hardening just thinking about it. On an unrelated note, I could really go for some fried chicken right about now. Number 72, Fighting Tyson, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Even taking into account that he's more than double the age of most of us here at Team Triple Jump, not a single one of us, including our boxing editor, Alex, would stand a chance in a real-world fight against Mike Tyson. Thankfully, video games exist, so we could all at least pretend we're hard enough to take on one of the greatest boxers of all time. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, was adapted from the arcade games Punch-Out! and Super Punch-Out! and was released for the NES in 1986. Seven. Players stepped into the shoes, or rather pulled on the gloves, of Little Mac, a boxer trying to make his way up the ranks of the World Video Boxing Association. In order to make it to the tippy top, he must face and beat the very best. After successfully besting a series of opponents, Little Mac has one final challenge ahead of him, beat Mike Tyson. Now these days, Mike Tyson is probably most famous for sporting a somewhat silly face tattoo, and for some seriously reprehensible behaviour in the early 90s, but at the time of the game's release, he was the world heavyweight champion. As such, the pride players felt after beating him was incomparable. After all, they'd just taken on the best of the best, the cream of the crop, the creme de la creme, and emerged victorious. We can only imagine how good it would have felt. Number 71, Psychomantis Breaks the Fourth Wall, Metal Gear Solid. 
We've experienced a number of frightening moments in our time as gamers, but on most occasions, we can calm down by telling ourselves that it's just the game, and the game is confined to our consoles and can't actually do anything to us. Then, Hideo Kojima decided that it would be really good fun to have one of his characters be able to actually mess with players. Horrible. Genius but utterly horrible. Partway through 1998's Metal Gear Solid, players go face to face with Psycho Mantis, a psychic profiler and telekinesis expert working for Liquid Snake's Foxhound unit. Not only is the villain able to read the minds of characters in the game, but seemingly he can read the mind of the player as well. Somewhat terrifyingly, Psycho Mantis was able to tell players what other PlayStation games they've been playing, could make their controller move across the floor using his psychokinetic powers, and was even able to preempt all of their attacks. Naturally, this was just the game reading players' memory cards, setting off the vibration in the DualShock controller, and reacting to the controller inputs, which could only be overcome by disconnecting your controller and plugging it into another port. But as youngsters, many players didn't realise this, and genuinely thought that Psychomantis had psychic powers. Truly spooky stuff. Number 70. Roland's Death, Borderlands 2. The Borderlands series isn't exactly famed for its emotional heft, which is probably part of the reason that Roland's death was so devastating to players. We were just here to have some fun, and now everything's all sad and stuff, we didn't sign up for this! Roland was first introduced in 2009's Borderlands and was one of the four playable characters that players could choose from. He then made his next appearance in 2012's Borderlands 2. Prior to meeting the new Vault Hunters, Roland was captured by the bandit group The Bloodshots, who were looking to claim the bounty placed on his head. Once players have rescued Roland, he is able to resume his position as leader of the Crimson Raiders and will assign quests to the player. Later, Roland joins the Vault Hunters as they attempt to retrieve the Vault Key from Control Core Angel. He's able to lower the shields, protecting Angel's Iridium Injectors, which allows the Vault Hunters to destroy them, but just as it seems like our heroes have succeeded, he's shot dead by antagonist Handsome Jack. Naturally, players were devastated to see such a beloved character murdered before their very eyes, but what was perhaps the most galling thing about it was the fact that it came completely out of nowhere. Of course, Handsome Jack gets what's coming to him in the end, but no number of bullets to his megalomaniacal head could ever bring back our dear Roland, or indeed heal the heartbreak we all experienced. Rest easy, soldier. Number 69. Nice! Tim is the villain all along. Braid. We've all experienced times in our lives when we've backed the wrong horse, and it will often leave us feeling very disappointed in ourselves for having been played for a fool. Sometimes, video games will trick us into rooting for the wrong person too, but generally speaking, it will only be for a short while before the true protagonist is revealed. Not Braid, though. No, Braid had us cheering on the villain for its entire runtime, only to reveal right at the end that its main character is a bit of a bastard. Throughout this 2009 puzzle platformer, players take on the role of Tim, a man who is attempting to save a princess from a monster. Who Tim is to the princess remains a mystery to the player, and the only thing we're told is that he's made some sort of mistake for which he hopes to make amends. In the last level of the game, Tim is able to make it to the home of the princess, but when he gets there, he finds himself locked out. It's at this point that it transpires that the level has been playing out in reverse, and that the knight, from whom the princess appears to be running, is actually trying to rescue her, and it's Tim that's been the monster all along. We'd usually be mad at being duped in such a way, but we really have to hand it to Braid for giving us one of the finest plot twists in gaming history. Number 68. Jin's Horse Falls, Ghost of Tsushima. Thus far on this list, we've revisited some of the most devastating human deaths in video game history, and they are all, without exception, truly upsetting. As much as it pains us to see a person die, though, it's undoubtedly far more distressing when we have to witness the death of an animal companion. Of all of the furry friends we've lost over the years, though, few have stuck with us quite like the demise of Jin's horse in Ghost of Tsushima. Players first make the acquaintance of Jin's trusty steed at the beginning of Ghost of Tsushima and even get the chance to name them, either Nobu, meaning trust, Sora, meaning sky, or Kage, meaning shadow. Throughout Jin's many trials and tribulations, his horse remains by his side, and most players became quite attached to their equine pal. Alas, a happy ending was not on the cards for Jin's horse. At the end of Act 2, Jin is imprisoned by his uncle while trying to track down antagonist Khan. Thanks to Kenji, though, he's able to break out, find his horse, and escape his captors, though not before his noble steed has taken a number of arrows. 
Ever faithful, Jin's horse carries him as far away as possible, but ultimately his wounds prove fatal. The scene as the injured mount presses forwards despite clearly suffering is heartbreaking to behold, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room when the horse finally fell. Number 67. Lee's Goodbye – The Walking Dead Season 1 Saying goodbye to a cherished video game character is never an easy task, but being forced to choose between euthanizing a faithful companion or leaving them to turn into a terrifying monster as players are in The Walking Dead Season 1 is frankly unbearable. The Walking Dead Season 1 and its many follow-ups are set in the same world as The Walking Dead comics and TV show, but rather than featuring characters that fans of the franchise already knew, Telltale opted to tell the stories of brand new characters. Season 1's main protagonist is Lee Everett, a man who is being transported to prison to begin a life sentence for murder just as the zombie apocalypse kicks off. After his police cruiser hits a walker and crashes, Lee is able to escape and he makes it to a suburban home in which he finds Clementine, an eight-year-old girl who is alone as her parents went to Savannah and left her with a babysitter. Over the course of the game, Lee becomes something of a father figure to Clem and tries unsuccessfully to reunite her with her parents. Whilst their group shelters in an abandoned mansion near Savannah, Clem is kidnapped and in his haste to find her, Lee is bitten. Thankfully, Lee is able to save the girl, but he ultimately succumbs to the infection and heartbroken players are forced to choose whether to have Clem leave him to turn or shoot Lee to spare him his grisly fate. No, I'm not crying. You're crying. Number 66. Iwao dies in Ryo's arms. Shenmue. Sometimes, all it takes is the premise of adventure to set a protagonist on their journey. Other times, like in 1999's Shenmue, tragic circumstances give a protagonist no choice but to set out on their quest. Of course, it does sadden us that Iwao gets murdered, but without it, we wouldn't have gotten such a fantastic game. Sometimes, sacrifices are necessary in the name of entertainment. Despite being over two decades old, the opening to Shenmue still stands out as one of the most shocking and memorable in video game history. In 1986, teenage protagonist Ryo Huzuki returns to his family dojo one day to find his father, Iwao Huzuki, locked in a confrontation with the game's antagonist, Lan Di. Lan Di is able to overpower Iwao and demands to know where the mysterious dragon mirror is hidden, threatening Ryo's life as he does so. Not wanting to see his son killed, Iwao gives up the location of the mirror, but it transpires that Landy isn't just there for the artifact, and asks Iwao if he remembers Chao Sung Ming, a man Iwao murdered before striking a killing blow. As Landy and his men leave, poor Ryo is helpless as his father dies in his arms. Phew, <sighs> that's been three devastating deaths in a row now. I think we'd better choose something slightly more lighthearted for this next entry. Number 65. The Train. Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. We know exactly what will cheer you all up after we've talked about the demises of several much-loved video game characters. A much-loved video game character in mortal peril, of course. Thankfully, Uncharted series protagonist Nathan Drake does ultimately survive this somewhat chaotic commute, but that didn't stop the whole debacle from keeping players on the edge of their seats and chewing their fingernails to nubs. Set two years after Uncharted Drake's fortune, Uncharted 2 Among Thieves sees treasure hunters Nathan Drake and Chloe Frazier and journalist Elena Fisher searching for the Chintamani Stone and Shambhala, all whilst battling war criminal Zoran Lazarevich and his militia. Whilst pursuing Lazarevich, Nate is able to catch up to his train and fights his way through a number of Lazarevich's men in order to find Chloe. When she refuses to leave, Nate finds himself cornered and, having no other choice, opts to cause an explosion that derails the train and leaves it dangling over a cliff. Both what preceded and follows are perhaps some of the most tense moments we gamers have ever experienced, as Nate then attempts to climb up the wreckage to safety. Of course, he makes it, and being the series protagonist he was always going to, but the whole situation caused us players some serious anxiety. It was very cool, though. Number 64. Tequila Sunset, Disco Elysium. We've all done things that we're less than proud of when we've imbibed one too many alcoholic beverages. For most of us, though, our embarrassing antics generally extend only as far as texting something regrettable to an ex or showing ourselves up at karaoke. What a hero. Look at him go. I imagine most people have never gotten so drunk that they've driven their car off a jetty whilst giving themselves a new jaunty nickname. Most people, however, aren't Disco Elysium protagonist Harry A. Harry Dubois. One of the many mysteries that Harry must solve throughout Disco Elysium's runtime is finding the identity of the Traffic Hooligan, a joyrider that has jumped a vehicle over the canal and crashed it. 
Once the water lock has been fixed, Harry and his partner Kim will be able to access the coast and wait for low tide. And when the vehicle is revealed, Harry finds his badge inside and comes to the shocking realization that he, himself, is in fact the traffic hooligan. By speaking to the Union of Moribund Alcoholics in the fishing village, players find out that not only did Harry crash the car whilst on a drunken bender, but prior to doing so, had dubbed himself Tequila Sunset and declared that the time hath come for the end of all things. On the surface, the whole debacle sounds hilarious, but it's actually quite a tragic glimpse into the psyche of a man who doesn't feel like he has all that much to live for. Trust us, the longer you reflect on it, the worse you'll feel. Number 63. Exiting the Sewers – The Elder Scrolls IV – Oblivion If there's one thing that Bethesda is well known for, aside from re-releasing Skyrim every three weeks, it's grand openings, and few are quite as epic as that of The Elder Scrolls IV – Oblivion. In the fourth installment in The Elder Scrolls series, players are entrusted with the Amulet of Kings and must attempt to thwart the efforts of a fanatical cult who is attempting to open a portal to the demonic realm of Oblivion. It's up to the player character to journey across Cyrodiil and undertake various quests in order to ensure that Tamriel doesn't become overrun with demons. Before all of that, though, they must escape from prison. Held for an undisclosed crime, the player is pardoned by Emperor Uriel Septim VII, whom they then join for a delightfully dreary jaunt through the sewers. Players could have been forgiven for thinking that the entire game would consist of dark, grimy, monster-filled dungeons, and after half an hour or so of wandering about underground, they might have come to the conclusion that their character would never see the light of day again. Thankfully, that wasn't the case, and there was a literal light at the end of the tunnel. I doubt any of us will ever forget that first look at Cyrodiil in all of its majesty. Truly, a breathtaking sight to behold. Number 62. Starkiller Brings Down a Star Destroyer – Star Wars The Force Unleashed if you're a fan of Star Wars, then you'll know that Force users are capable of some fairly impressive feats. Darth Vader has the ability to choke the life out of someone without even touching them, Master Yoda can lift an X-Wing out of a bog with just his mind, and Obi-Wan Kenobi can always be counted upon to find the high ground. However, perhaps the coolest thing we've ever seen a Star Wars character do is pull a whole ass Imperial Star Destroyer out of the sky using only the power of the Force. That, my dudes, is metal as heck. Released in 2008, Star Wars The Force Unleashed tells the story of Galen Marek, aka Starkiller, a powerful Force user and apprentice of Darth Vader, as he attempts to foster rebellion within the galaxy in order to create the perfect conditions to allow Vader to overthrow the Emperor. In order to convince more people to join the rebellion, Vader tasks Starkiller with attacking a Star Destroyer facility on Raxus Prime to demonstrate to the galaxy that the Empire isn't as strong as it claims to be. As he devastates the facility, a Star Destroyer begins approaching and fast. Rather than fleeing, though, Starkiller uses the Force to pull it from the sky, sending it crashing to the ground below. I suppose size really doesn't matter after all. Number 61. Loghain's Betrayal – Dragon Age Origins now, we're not naive enough to think that every character we meet in a video game is on the up and up, but that still doesn't prevent us from feeling somewhat betrayed regardless when we get stabbed in the back by them. Case in point, Loghain's dick move at the beginning of 2009 Bioware RPG Dragon Age Origins. Inspired by the likes of The Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire, Dragon Age Origins puts players into the role of either a warrior, mage, or rogue and tasks them with defeating the archdemon that commands a monstrous force known as the Darkspawn. At the beginning of the game, the player character is recruited into the Ferelden Grey Wardens by Duncan, the Grey Wardens' commander, and the pair journey to Ferelden's southern fortress to join Caelan, the King of Ferelden, and his father-in-law and legendary general, Loghain. Upon arrival, the player undergoes a ritual to induct them into the Grey Wardens, and must then join their comrade Alistair in lighting a beacon which will serve as a signal to Loghain's men, who will then charge the Darkspawn Horde. Only, Loghain decides to save his own hide instead, and abandons the battlefield, leaving his men, along with Caelan and Duncan, to be slain by the Darkspawn, who then proceed to take control of the fortress. What a knobber. Number 60. Choosing your starter Pokemon – Pokemon Red and Blue As gamers, we're often faced with impossible choices – which companion to save, which side to take in a battle, what to say to an NPC – all very tough. The trickiest choice we've ever had to make, though, is undoubtedly which starter Pokemon to pick at the beginning of Pokemon Red or Blue. Both games are set in the Kanto region, which is based on the real-life Kanto region of Japan. Players start their journey in Pallet Town, from which they set out to explore, collect Pokemon, and become a Pokemon master. Before they head out, though, they'll need their starter Pokemon 
which is provided to them by Pokemon researcher Professor Oak. Players accompany Oak to his laboratory, where they're given a choice of three adorable creatures. The water-type Squirtle, grass-type Bulbasaur, or fire-type Charmander. All three have their strengths and weaknesses. Charmander, for example, can easily best a grass-type like Bulbasaur, but would get its ass handed to it by a water-type such as Squirtle, and so choosing was an absolute nightmare for players. Regardless of which starter Pokemon you picked, though, both Pokemon Red and Blue were fantastic games, but I don't think any of us will ever forget just how difficult it was to choose our very first Pokemon. Oh, and in case you're wondering, mine was Charmander. Charizard for the win, am I right? Number 59. Pac-Man meets Miss Pac-Man. Miss Pac-Man. The world of video gaming is filled to the brim with iconic couples. Mario and Peach, Ethan and Elena, Geralt and Yennefer, or Triss if that's the direction you decided to take things in, all romantic duos that had players believing in the power of love. Perhaps the absolute most iconic video game couple of them all, however, is Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man, who first met all the way back in 1982 and have been going strong ever since. Gamers even got to witness their monumental union in Miss Pac-Man, the game in which the two first set eyes on each other, and it's safe to say it was love at first sight. Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man first meet at the end of stage one, and once they've shaken off the ghosts that are harassing them, it's heart eyes all round. As the game progresses, so does their romance, and over the course of Miss Pac-Man's runtime, the two fall in love, have a baby, and finally head off into the sunset to live happily ever wacker. Ever after, sorry. God, it's almost enough to bring a tear to your eye, isn't it? Almost. What, you think I'd get teary over the love of two pixelated yellow blobs? Well, you'd be wrong. You'd be very wrong, so just shut up about it, okay? Number 58. Tidus and Yuna Kiss. Final Fantasy X. We're sticking with heartwarming couples for the moment as we turn our attention to Yuna and Tidus. Or Tidus, if you want to get wrong pronunciation about this. Yeah, that's right, I said it. Two of the playable characters from 2001's Final Fantasy X. Set in the world of Spira, Final Fantasy X follows a group of adventurers as they embark on a quest to defeat Sin, a rampaging monster. The game's main protagonist is Tidus, a star blitzball player who winds up in Spira after Sin destroys his home city of Xanakand. Shortly after arriving in Spira, Tidus joins a number of guardians who are on a journey to help Yuna, a summoner and devout follower of Yevon, defeat Sin. She must travel to temples located all across the world, acquire the Eon from each, and ultimately summon the final Eon to a battle that will kill them both. Throughout their journey, however, Tidus and Yuna fall in love, which results in one of the sweetest moments in all of video gaming. After breaking into the Chamber of the Faith and receiving Bahamut, Yuna and her guardians are branded traitors by the Yevon, and although they're able to escape, Yuna's faith in the Yevon is somewhat shaken. She goes to the spring in the Macalania woods to be alone, but Tidus goes after her, and after discussing her pilgrimage, the two finally share a kiss. Aw, oh, how lovely. Number 57. Shepherd's Death, Mass Effect 2. There aren't many developers that have the balls to kill off their game's protagonist, let alone do it within the first few minutes of its runtime, and so we've really got to hand it to Bioware for having the cojones to off Shepard right at the beginning of Mass Effect 2. The game opens in the year 2183, not long after the events of the first Mass Effect. Whilst patrolling for Geth resistance, the SSV Normandy is attacked, and the crew is forced to abandon the ship. However, rather than heading to the escape pods with the rest of the crew, Joker remains in the cockpit in an attempt to save the vessel. Thankfully, Shepard is able to convince him that the Normandy is going down regardless, and the pair head to the escape pods. <laughs> Phew, that was close. They'll both get in one of the pods and everything will be okay, right? Right? Well, no, not exactly. Joker does indeed manage to make it to safety, but in all of the chaos and destruction, he and Shepard are separated, and as the ship is destroyed, Shepard is sucked into the vastness of space, their suit is breached, and they suffocate to death. 
Of course, this isn't the end for Shepard, and their body is recovered by Cerberus and they're eventually brought back to life, but for a moment there, we players thought we'd be making our way through Mass Effect 2 somewhat Shepardless. Number 56. Abe is thrown into a meat grinder. Oddworld Abe's Odyssey. You know what we literally just said about devs not having the balls to kill off their game's protagonists? Well, as if this very list is doing its best to disprove our writers' theories, here's another example of a studio with some serious stones. The first game in the Oddworld series, Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, tells the story of the eponymous Abe, a Madokan slave who works in a meat processing plant. Whilst going about his duties one day, he happens to overhear the plant's owner, Moloch the Gluckan, telling other Gluckans that the plant is losing money as there's been a decline in the population of the animals that supply the meat, and that he plans to instead harvest the Mudokans. Fearing for his life and those of his fellow Mudokan slaves, Abe escapes and sets out on a quest to save his brethren. Should Abe be successful in his mission and save at least 50 Mudokans over the course of the game, then they're able to rally together to save Abe when Moloch captures him at the end. However, if Abe doesn't save at least 50 of his comrades, then Moloch goes through with his plan to throw Abe into a meat grinder. It's not very often that villains actually end up pulling off their dastardly plans, and I don't think we'll ever forget the sheer horror we felt as our dear Abe was so cruelly dispatched. Now, before we get to the next entry, if you don't mind, I'll just, uh, mm, mm. Sorry, it's a long old list. I've got a burger here just keeping me going. Uh, hmm. Tastes a bit funny. Number 55. Sora becomes a heartless Kingdom Hearts. Over the years, we here at Team Triple Jump have done our best to fully wrap our heads around what's going on in the Kingdom Hearts series. And today, we're pleased to tell you that after nearly four years of round-the-clock research, we still aren't 100% sure, but we've got a very vague grasp of the broad strokes, and as such, we now understand why fans were so upset at Sora becoming a Heartless at the end of the first game in the series. Released in 2002, Kingdom Hearts tells the story of Sora, a young man who must vanquish the forces of darkness, and who is aided by a whole bunch of familiar Disney faces, including the likes of Goofy and Donald Duck. The plot is somewhat convoluted, but basically, our main protagonists are attempting to stop Big Bad Ansem from using corrupted beings, the Heartless, to gain power. After learning that secondary antagonist Riku has used the incomplete Keyblade of Heart to summon the final keyhole of Hollow Bastion, Sora, Goofy, and Donald track him down to the Great Hall. Once there, it's revealed that the Lost Heart of Kairi, another of the trio's chums, has been within Sora all along, and in order to save her, Sora turns the Keyblade on himself and winds up becoming one of the dark creatures he's been fighting this whole time. Absolutely devastating, or at least we think it is. Honestly, we're still not totally sure what's happening. <laughs> Number 54, Through the Fire and Flames, Guitar Hero 3, Legends of Rock. As soon as it was revealed in 2005, Guitar Hero was a sensation and had hard-rocking gamers the world over jamming to classic tunes. Naturally, this led to sequels and more set lists to master, though there are few out there that can say they were able to fully conquer 2007's Guitar Hero 3, Legends of Rock owing to the final track of the game being so gosh darn complex. Like its predecessors, Guitar Hero 3 was a game of the rhythm action variety that presented players with a little plastic guitar peripheral and had them pressing buttons and strumming along to popular rock hits. The soundtrack included tunes from the likes of Guns N' Roses, Aerosmith, and Metallica, and songs ranged from simple and straightforward to downright devilish. The most frustrating of the lot, however, wasn't even part of the set list, but was instead the song that closed out the game with the credits, Through the Fire and Flames by British power metal outfit Dragon Force. I think most players will agree that they'll never forget the first time they face this absolute nightmare of a track, and though some will have made it all the way to the end, very few will have conquered it on any of the game's harder modes. Not only did the notes come at players frighteningly fast, but the song was also over seven minutes long, and Christ, I'm getting carpal tunnel just thinking about it. Can we move on, please? 
Number 53, The Ladder, Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Eater. Well, 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 would you look at that. It's another appearance from everyone's favorite best friend of Jeff Keighley, Hideo Kojima. I'd love to say this is the last time the video game author will be making an appearance on this list, but I would absolutely be lying. After all, he's been responsible for so many memorable moments over the years, we could have probably filled this entire video with iconic occurrences from Hideo Kojima games alone. That probably wouldn't have been very fun for you guys, though. Or perhaps it would have, who knows. There are a number of moments from 2004's Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater alone that could have made this list, and although the death of the boss at the hands of Naked Snake came pretty close to being our pick, we ultimately decided to go with the ladder sequence. Once Snake has dealt with the end, that is, the sniper known as the end, not the end of the world, he must make his way to the top of the Krasnogorji Mountains. Thankfully, he doesn't need to get his climbing gear out though, as there just so happens to be a ladder for him to ascend. What follows is a climb that takes three minutes of real time to complete. Players might have thought this was just Kojima messing with them, but the sequence serves as an intermission amidst the chaos, allowing players to soak in everything they've done thus far. Oh, and if the climb itself didn't stick with you, then the chills you got from the a cappella version of Snake Eater that plays over the scene certainly will have. Number 52, Pyramid Head's first appearance, Silent Hill 2. The Silent Hill series is teeming with unsettling baddies, and while there are many that have stuck with plays in the years since they first appeared, not a single one is as memorable as Silent Hill 2 antagonist Pyramid Head, a figure made all the more terrifying by his bizarre introduction. Silent Hill 2 focuses its attention on James Sunderland, a man who travels to the town of Silent Hill after receiving a letter from his wife Mary. Under normal circumstances, receiving a letter from one's wife might not be too strange, but it just so happens that Mary has been dead for three years. Just a quick note for all my friends and family, if I die and you later receive a letter from me asking you to travel to some creepy destination, maybe just ignore it? Yeah, maybe, maybe try that. Upon his arrival to the titular town, James meets a number of, shall we say, interesting characters, and it's not long before he's face to face with one of the most iconic monsters in all of gaming. Whilst passing through an apartment complex that James believes will lead him to the special place mentioned in Mary's letter, he encounters Pyramid Head in a somewhat compromising position. As though his very appearance alone weren't frightening enough, players were introduced to the villain in one of the most grotesque ways possible, and I doubt there's a gamer out there who wasn't completely horrified by this scene. Oh god. Number 51, Getting Abducted by Aliens, Prey 2006. You know, I've always wondered what it would be like to get abducted by aliens. After all, surely not every alien race out there is the anal probing or human murdering sort. There must be some that simply want to share their technology with us, or, you know, teach us the secret to perfectly poaching an egg or something, that would be, that'd be nice. Sadly, the aliens at the center of Human Head Studios 2006 first person shooter, Prey, or Prey 1 if you want to get serious about this, are the human murdering sort, and so I'd appreciate it if they'd miss me out with their particular brand of abduction. Thank you very much. Prey's protagonist is Domasi Tommy Tawodi, a Cherokee man who dreams of leaving the Native American reservation on which he lives. Here's where things get a bit careful what you wish for, though. When Tommy tries to convince his girlfriend, Jen, to leave the reservation with him, the two begin to argue, but they're interrupted by a pair of men drinking at the bar who begin hitting on Jen and refusing to leave when told to. Tommy is able to subdue the pair, but just as Jen berates him for resorting to violence, the two of them, along with Tommy's grandfather, Anisi, are abducted by aliens and wind up on a spaceship known as the Sphere, which is consuming both organic and inanimate materials from Earth in order to sustain itself. Oh, talk about a rough Friday night. Number 50, The First Colossus, Shadow of the Colossus. 
as is the case for many of the games featured on this list, we struggled to pick just one iconic moment from Shadow of the Colossus. We had originally thought of going for the big reveal at the end of the game, but honestly, we still feel super rotten about that, so we've instead decided to go with the first time that players clap eyes on a Colossus. If you haven't played Shadow of the Colossus, then we highly recommend that you do so. Originally released in 2005 and later remastered in 2018, Shadow of the Colossus tells the story of Wanda, a young man that seeks the power to revive the fair maiden Mono. He is told by Dormin that if he can find and destroy the 16 colossi that roam the land, Dormin will be able to resurrect Mono. Ultimately, it transpires that Dormin isn't exactly the helpful, friendly entity that he's led us to believe. And in destroying the colossi, Wanda has not only doomed himself, but also potentially the rest of the world. This is, of course, shocking and memorable, but in our opinion, nothing from the game has stuck with us quite like the first time we saw a colossus. Introducing itself with a terrifying roar, this gigantic creature is as awe-inspiring as it is huge, and no doubt every player upon sighting it for the first time had the same thought running through their mind. I'm supposed to fight and kill that. Number 49, Ethan's Sacrifice, Resident Evil Village. I'll be honest, if I'd learned that my infant daughter had been kidnapped by some mold-worshipping cult, chopped into several pieces, and placed in jars that were guarded by mutated nightmares, I probably wouldn't go looking for her myself. I feel like that's probably what the authorities are for. I, however, am not Ethan Winters, a man who is simply unwilling to sit by as the aforementioned shenanigans unfold. Resident Evil Village was released in May 2021 and continues a story of the Winters family that began in Resident Evil 7. Three years after the events at the Baker House, Mia, Ethan and their baby daughter Rose are living in Europe, and all seems to be going well until one evening when Chris Redfield shows up, shoots Mia and kidnaps Ethan and Rose. When Ethan awakens, having been knocked out by a member of Chris's squad, he finds a truck that he was riding in has crashed, and Rose is gone. It ultimately transpires the leader of the eponymous village, Mother Miranda, has taken Rose and plans to use the child to revive her own daughter, Ava. She's been using the mole to try and bring the kid back, and the village's lords, Lycans, and even Evelyn are all experiments of hers. In the end, Ethan is able to piece Rose back together, but as he tries to escape the village, he finds himself at his limit and sacrifices himself to see that Rose is safe. What an absolute hero. Ethan Winters, we salute you. Number 48, The Nuke. Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare. The idea of nuclear war is absolutely terrifying, but thankfully, it's not something we have to worry about at all, because all of our world leaders are nice and stable, and there's absolutely no chance that we could all be wiped out by a missile at any given moment. Can can someone check on Cap? Got a bit dark all of a sudden, didn't it? Luckily, we don't have to worry about such things in our favourite video games, unless you're playing Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. The game tells a story of a civil war in Russia between its government and ultra-nationalists, and a coup d'etat in an unnamed Middle Eastern country, which has been spearheaded by separatist leader Khaled al-Assad. Acting on intelligence that leads them to believe that al-Assad might be in possession of a nuclear device, the US launches a full-scale assault on his palace. SEAL Team 6 raids the place, engages Al-Assad's ground forces, and seemingly comes out victorious. However, as they're leaving in a helicopter, the nuclear missile is detonated, and the players could only look on in horror, as the entire city is levelled by the blast, and the SEAL's helicopter comes crashing down. We gamers have witnessed a great deal of death and destruction in our time, but I doubt there's a single Call of Duty player that's been able to erase the sight of that bomb going off from their memory. Number 47, Retrieving the Blades of Chaos, God of War 2018. If you've played 2018's God of War, you'll know that your boy Kratos doesn't really like talking about his past, and so it's somewhat monumental when he finally embraces it. Unlike the first few God of War games, which draw heavily from Greek mythology, 2018's God of War is based on Norse mythology, and sees tattooed hunk Kratos and his son Atreus journeying through the many realms in order to scatter the ashes of Kratos' wife from the highest peak. Kratos has neglected to tell Atreus that he, Kratos, is a god, and by extension, so is Atreus, which causes some pretty nasty side effects for the boy, as his body is unable to cope with the belief that he is mortal. This comes to a head after the pair are attacked by Thor's sons, Modi and Magni, and Atreus collapses. In order to cure the boy, Kratos takes him to Freya, who tells him that she can save him, but she will need the heart of a Helheim troll. And with his current weapon, the Leviathan Axe, Kratos doesn't stand a chance of surviving the 
the realm. This prompts Kratos to return home, and in an epic scene that calls back to the previous games, he retrieves the Blades of Chaos from a hiding place under his floorboards. So iconic, so shiny, and so stabby. Number 46, Eve's Awakening, Parasite Eve. You know what's scary? Spontaneous human combustion. Or put more simply, the fact that people can, at any given moment, just burst into flames. Well, allegedly, anyway. There haven't been many conclusive examples of the phenomena. Still, if real, bloody terrifying. We bring this up because we're about to take a look at Parasite Eve, the 1998 horror title from our friends over at Square, which focuses on a villain with the power to make people catch fire. Parasite Eve was a sequel to the novel of the same name, and follows NYPD rookie cop Aya Bria as she tries to put a stop to the titular Eve, who plans to destroy the entire human race by means of, you guessed it, a really big nuke. Just kidding. No, our somewhat unhinged pal Eve plans to rid the world of its people problem by getting them all to spontaneously combust, starting with almost the entire audience at an opera on Christmas Eve. Thankfully, one of those spared is Aya, who gives chase to another who did not catch fire, an actress, Melissa, who, once backstage, transforms into a horrifying beast and declares her name is now Eve. The scene where Melissa transforms into Eve, accompanied by an unsettling operatic score, makes for some seriously frightening viewing, and we can't imagine that many Parasite Eve players got a good night's sleep for a while after witnessing it. Number 45, Save Chloe or Save the Town, Life is Strange. We've already spoken about difficult choices in video games, and while yes, choosing your starter Pokemon is very hard, no matter what you pick, it's not going to get anyone killed. The same can't be said for the final choice of 2015's Life is Strange, in which players are forced to pick between the life of a beloved friend and the destruction of their hometown. Life is Strange follows the journey of Max, a photography student who, shortly after witnessing a classmate shoot and kill a girl, finds that she has the power to rewind time. I tell ya, if I'd have quit for every time that happened, that would come in very handy. It turns out that the girl Max is able to save is her old friend Chloe, and over the course of the game, the pair are able to use Max's powers to figure out what happened to Chloe's missing friend, Rachel Amber. Sadly, and as someone of note once said, with great power comes great responsibility, and the girls ultimately find out that messing with time has consequences, namely, a giant tornado. As the storm becomes more and more fierce, players are faced with a decision to either let it rage on, destroying the whole town in the process, or going all the way back to the first time Max used her powers to rescue her friend and allowing Chloe to die. It's a heartbreaking choice no matter what option you pick, and you'll feel awful about it for ages afterwards. Number 44, you're a Templar, Assassin's Creed 3. The conflict between the freedom-loving assassins and the order-seeking Templars is the basis for the Assassin's Creed series, and it's generally accepted that the assassins are the good guys, and as such, the protagonists are all on their side. It's for this reason that we'll never forget the sheer audacity of Assassin's Creed 3 for making us play as a dirty, stinking Templar for the first part of the game. Yucky! Assassin's Creed 3 largely takes place in the 18th century, and for much of the game, players jump into the shoes of Rato Hangadon, aka Connor, as he fights against the Templars and tries to thwart their attempts to gain control of the colonies. However, for the first part of the game, the protagonist is Haytham Kenway, Connor's father. The year is 1754, and on the orders of, uh, his order, Haytham assassinates a patron of the Royal Opera House in order to steal the piece of Eden that's in his possession. He then travels to the American colonies to find the temple it unlocks, recruits allies and frees slaves, but when he gets to the temple, he cannot gain access. Upon returning to his men, Haytham shares his failure, but encourages the group not to give up hope. It's at this point he moves to induct another man, Charles, into the Order, and it's here that it's revealed that Haytham and his pals have been Templars all along. I can't believe you'd pull the wool over our eyes like that, Assassin's Creed 3. For shame. For shame. Number 43, The Samus Reveal, Metroid. Back in the day, it was a widely held belief that video games were for boys, and that being the case, that boys would only want to play video games about other boys. Thankfully, things have moved on quite a bit, and by and large, both the video games industry and players themselves recognise that, just occasionally, ladies like to get in on the action too. 
The reason I bring this up is that it's important context for why the Samus reveal at the end of the 1986 action-adventure title Metroid is so iconic. In the game, players take on the role of Samus Aaron, a bounty hunter who must retrieve the eponymous Metroid parasites from space pirates on the planet Zebes before they can turn them into a biological weapon. The game wasn't just a critical and commercial success, but it also spawned a plethora of imitators and even launched its own genre. Throughout the game, Samus wears a spacesuit that completely obscures her from the player, and her gender is kept a secret. At the end of the game, however, she removes her suit, and gamers of the 80s were stunned to discover that they've been playing as a woman the entire time. These days, a game having a female protagonist isn't all that unusual, but back then, it was truly groundbreaking, and has gone down in history as one of gaming's most iconic reveals. Number 42, The T-Rex, Tomb Raider. Typical, you wait half of a big list for an iconic lady of gaming to show up, and then two show up at once. Bloody sod's law, isn't it? Indeed, we're turning our attention now to 1996's Tomb Raider, a game that proves that anything those gun-shooting, ass-kicking boys could do, the gun-shooting, ass-kicking girls could do just as well, thank you very much. Tomb Raider centres on protagonist Lara Croft, an archaeologist slash adventurer who is approached by businesswoman Jacqueline Natler and asked to recover the Scion of Atlantis, a powerful artifact that was split into three and buried in separate places. Across multiple levels, players were tasked with solving puzzles, collecting items and, of course, fighting enemies. Whilst we were all prepared to fight off against evil henchmen and the odd creature or two, I don't think any of us were expecting what awaited us in the game's third level. Whilst navigating the Lost Valley, players quickly found that things had taken a turn for the prehistoric and were suddenly faced with some rather ferocious looking reptilian foes, including a very big, very hungry looking Tyrannosaurus Rex. Eagle-eyed players might have noticed some rather large footprints on the ground that hinted the T-Rex impending introduction, but I doubt even the most perceptive of players were prepared for the thing charging at them full pelt. I hope you're wearing your brown adventuring trousers, is all I'm saying. Number 41, Morden Song, Mass Effect 3. Time for a bit more Mass Effect now, as we turn our attention to the third and final entry in the original trilogy, a game for which we have, sadly, never received a follow-up. No, I will not acknowledge Mass Effect Andromeda. Now, of course, there are those out there that have played Mass Effect 3 that won't have experienced this particular moment, and arguably, those players are the lucky ones. Unless you'd gotten more than killed in Mass Effect 2, then the Salarian will appear on Sirkesh in Mass Effect 3. When Shepard arrives seeking a cure for the Genophage in order to secure an alliance with the Krogan, Morden reveals the cure can be extracted from a cured female, and he joins Shepard and the gang to work on it from the comfort of the Normandy. Once the cure is complete, Morden prepares to plant it in the Shroud, a construct which alters the atmosphere of the planet Tachanka. But as he goes to do so, he notices that the Shroud has been sabotaged. At this point, players are faced with a tough choice, either shooting Morden to prevent the cure of the Genophage, or whilst given the illusion that it has been, convincing Morden not to dispense the cure, though again it will seem like it has, or allowing him to sacrifice himself to fix the sabotage. If players choose the latter, Morden will ascend the shroud, knowing full well that he's going to his doom, singing scientist Salarian as he goes. The song itself is quite a cheerful little ditty, but in the context of the scene, it takes on an altogether haunting tone, and players will have no doubt felt a twinge of sadness each time they've heard it since. Number 40. Scarecrow's Hallucinations – Batman Arkham Asylum Upon its release in 2009, Rocksteady Studios' Batman Arkham Asylum was met with universal acclaim, with critics falling over themselves to bestow praise upon its story, graphics, gameplay, voice acting, and pretty much everything else it had to offer, really. It won a whole boatload of awards, sold like hotcakes, and was even, for a time, a Guinness World Record holder, and could boast that it was the most critically acclaimed superhero game ever. That is, of course, until Batman Arkham City came along, and that was even better. As you can imagine, the game is filled with memorable moments, and we had a hard time whittling the contenders down to just one. In the end, we decided to break our rules a teeny tiny bit and choose Scarecrow's hallucinations. Yes, there are several sprinkled throughout the game, but each and every one stuck with us. The main antagonist is the Joker, but Arkham Asylum wouldn't be a Batman game without a bunch of secondary antagonists, and whilst they are all somewhat intimidating, none is as terrifying as Scarecrow, who through the use of his proprietary fear toxin is able to induce horrific hallucinations 
hallucinations. Batman's exposure to the toxin has seen him seeing visions of Commissioner Gordon's lifeless body, reliving the night his parents died, experiencing an alternate reality in which the Joker has him incarcerated in the asylum, and fleeing from a ginormous scarecrow. Every one of these moments sticks with the player long after the game is over, and it's for that reason that we're plonking them all on this list. Number 39. Mario's 3D Emergence from the First Pipe – Super Mario 64 When he made his debut in 1981, Mario, or Jumpman as he was known at the time, was a two-dimensional being and would stay that way for 15 more years. It wasn't until 1996 that Mario made his, quite literal, leap into 3D, and that moment has been emblazoned in our minds for all eternity. Super Mario 64 opens with a now three-dimensional Mario heading to Peach's castle for a slice of cake. No, no, not that sort of cake. Get your minds out of the gutter, come on. However, upon his arrival, he finds that Bowser has kidnapped the princess along with all of her servants and trapped her for using the castle's 120 power stars which are hidden within its paintings. Not one to stand for such nonsense, Mario gets to work at once, collecting the stars so that he can break the curse of the endless stairs and give Bowser what for. Super Mario 64 is a delight from start to finish and finally gave players the opportunity to explore Mario's world in glorious 3D. Undoubtedly though, the most iconic moment in the entire game comes at the very beginning when the camera encircles a big green pipe and Mario pops out fist aloft shouting Yahoo as Chris Pratt would put it as he goes. Truly a glorious sight to behold. Number 38. Kerrigan's Heel Turn – Starcraft Many of us here at Team Triple Jump are fans of the wrestles, and it brings us great joy to be able to apply wrestling terms to stuff that happens in video games. In this instance, we're referring to Sarah Kerrigan's shocking heel turn in the 1998 military sci-fi RTS, StarCraft. The game is set in a distant part of the Milky Way galaxy and weaves the tale of three intelligent species who are each vying for dominance. The Terrans, who are a group of humans exiled from Earth. The Zerg, a race of insect-like aliens that strive to achieve genetic perfection and assimilate other species. And the Protoss, a race of beings with highly advanced technology and psionic powers that simply seek to protect their way of life from the Zerg. StarCraft's story is told in three distinct parts, each of which focuses on one of the aforementioned races. In the first chapter, players alongside protagonist Jim Raynor attempts to control the Marsera following a Zerg attack, but when Raynor is arrested, the focus shifts to Arcturus Mengsk, who begins using Confederate technology for his own ends. However, whilst trying to lure the Zerg into the Confederate capital of Tarsonis, Mensk sacrifices his second-in-command, Sarah Kerrigan, and players are left to believe that she is dead. Only, she hasn't been killed, but has rather endured a fate worse than death. The Zerg have captured and infested her with their DNA, and she emerges as a powerful hybrid with both Zerg and Terran genetics. It's a horrible outcome for a sympathetic character, and one that StarCraft fans won't be forgetting in a hurry. Number 37. Dom's Sacrifice – Gears of War 3 Poor Dom. First his wife dies under horrific circumstances, and now this. We do naturally feel a little bad for including perhaps the worst things that Gears of War's Dom was forced to experience on this list, but then again we never said that it would be all sunshine and rainbows, and sadly both the death of Dom's wife and his own death in Gears of War 3 are particularly memorable. Gears of War 3, as the name might suggest, is the third instalment in Epic Games and Microsoft Studios' Gears of War series, and once again focuses on Delta Squad as they face the Locust Horde and the Lambent. The events of Gears of War 3 are set in motion when Chairman Prescott presents presents protagonist Marcus Phoenix with an encrypted disc and the information that his father is still alive, though is being held captive on Azura. Upon decoding the disc, they find that Azura is protected by man-made hurricane generators and as such is only accessible via submarine. Damn, that's unfortunate. Thankfully, the gang are able to quickly locate a submarine, but would you look at that? The previous occupant failed to return it with a full tank of gas. Ain't that just the way? The squad's bad luck doesn't end there either, as whilst adventuring in the town of Mercy to find some fuel, they're overrun by Locust and Lambent, and sensing no alternative, Dom takes it upon himself to cause a huge explosion to wipe out the vicious foes, sacrificing himself in the process. He may have gone out like a hero, but oh boy, did he deserve better. Number 36. Mecha Hitler – Wolfenstein 3D 
If there's one thing worse than genocidal European dictator Adolf Hitler, it's Mecha Hitler. But thanks to the events of the Allied Nations in World War II, no one's ever had to come face to face with such an abomination. Well, not unless you've played Wolfenstein 3D, of course. Released in 1992, this three-dimensional FPS is now considered to be the grandfather of 3D shooters and sees players taking on the role of William B.J. Blazkowicz, an Allied spy who must escape from the Nazi prison Castle Wolfenstein. Along the way, he finds himself facing a variety of different enemies, including Nazi guards, dogs, and mutant zombie super soldiers. Oh yeah, it turns out that in addition to all of the standard evil stuff in this timeline, Hitler was also faffing about with the occult, because that always ends so well. Luckily, players get the opportunity to put a stop to the Fuhrer once and for all in Wolfenstein 3D's third episode, though he doesn't exactly look like how we all expected. Indeed, rather than the squishy, mustachioed bloke we've all seen in documentaries on the History Channel, this Hitler has a large mechanical suit of armour that's equipped with not one, but four chain guns. It might be somewhat shocking and frightening to behold, but hey, if there's someone that can deal with it, it's our boy BJ Blazkowicz. Number 35. Facing Red. Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. Come join us now as we embark on an expedition to the regions of Johto and Kanto, lands of wonder, opportunity, and most importantly, hundreds and hundreds of adorable Pokemon. Like in both Pokemon Red and Blue, Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal see the player character setting out to become a Pokemon master. However, rather than Pallet Town in Kanto, their home is New Bark Town in Johto, and in place of Professor Oak is Professor Elm. Aside from that, though, the broad strokes are the same. Choose starter Pokemon, travel from town to town, defeat gym leaders, thwart Team Rocket's shenanigans, something, 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 profit. Once they've done all that, players can head back to the Kanto region and challenge the gym leaders there, and it's only after completing this mammoth task that they're able to enter Mount Silver and engage in the most difficult battle of the whole game against… Red? The protagonist from Pokemon Red and Blue? Well, this certainly is a shock. Indeed, it transpires that in the three years since the first games in the series, Red has become something of a recluse, training his Pokemon alone in the caves of Mount Silver. Players were undoubtedly surprised by his appearance as Gold, Silver, and Crystal's toughest challenge, but were probably also somewhat saddened at what the beloved protagonist had become. Number 34. The Dog. Duck Hunt. No one likes to be laughed at. Well, I suppose comedians like myself, probably the funniest man the UK has ever produced apparently, do. But most other folks prefer not to have people chuckle at their failures, no matter how hilarious the anecdote. Sadly, if you were playing 1984's Duck Hunt and weren't particularly good at it, it was something you had to get used to. Duck Hunt was a light gun title released in arcades and for the NES between 1984 and 1987, depending on whereabouts in the world you lived. The premise was fairly straightforward. Armed with the NES Zapper, it was up to players to shoot unfortunate waterfowl as they flew about the screen, and if successful, they'd earn points for their trouble. Despite all of the duck murder, Duck Hunt was wildly successful, selling over 26 million copies worldwide. By my calculation, though, that's 26 million people who had to suffer through being laughed at by the Duck Hunt dog. You see, if for whatever reason you were unable to shoot any ducks, this smug canine would pop up from the grass and chortle right in your face. The vast majority of players quickly came to resent the dog, and the arrogant git has frequently made lists of the most annoying and most loathed video game characters in history. Thankfully, if you're after a bit of revenge, the dog makes an appearance in the Super Smash Bros. series, so you can have a whale of a time knocking nine bells out of him. Yeah, that's what you get for mocking me. Number 33. It's dangerous to go alone, take this. The Legend of Zelda. We come now to yet another iconic quote from the world of video games, one that was originally uttered, or rather plastered, across players' screens all the way back in 1986. Do you know how good a piece of dialogue has to be to stick with people for almost 40 years? Pretty flippin' gosh darn good, I tells you. The Legend of Zelda is considered by many to be one of the greatest games ever made, not only due to the fact that it sold millions of copies and got a fantastic critical response, but because of the fond memories it created for players all around the world. The game is set in the fantasy kingdom of Hyrule during a period of chaos caused by Ganon, the Prince of Darkness and primary antagonist of the franchise, who has stolen the Triforce of Power, which makes up one third of an artifact that, if whole, bestows great strength upon the wielder. In an attempt to prevent Ganon from obtaining further pieces, Princess Zelda has split the Triforce of Wisdom into eight parts and hidden them in dungeons. In retaliation, she is kidnapped and it falls to a young boy named Link to rescue her. 
However, before embarking on his journey, Link must ensure he is armed, and upon entering a cave, he is presented with a wooden sword by an old man who tells him, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. Even if you've never played The Legend of Zelda, you'll no doubt be familiar with this iconic quote, and it's for this reason that we couldn't possibly have left it off our list. Number 32. Shodan's Reveal – System Shock 2 in the opinion of many gamers, System Shock antagonist Shodan is one of the finest villains in video game history. The malevolent AI spends the vast majority of the series' first game attempting to destroy all of Earth's cities after having killed or mutated most of the inhabitants of the Citadel station first. Luckily, the game's nameless hacker protagonist is able to face off against Shodan in cyberspace at the end of the game, destroying her for good, and she never caused anyone any problems ever again. Just kidding, she's back in the sequel to cause even more mayhem. Hooray! System Shock 2 takes place over 40 years after the events of System Shock, and opens with a soldier awakening with amnesia on the medical deck of the Von Braun, an experimental faster-than-light starship. Immediately after rousing from his slumber, the soldier is contacted by Dr. Janice Polito, who claims to be another survivor as she guides him to safety before the cabin depressurizes, before asking the soldier to meet her on Deck 4. Rather unfortunately, the two are not alone on this ship, and in order to reach Polito, the soldier must battle his way through a whole bunch of infested crew members and try to ignore the telepathic messages he receives from an alien communion known as The Many. He's a tough cookie though, so he's able to deal with all of this and make it to Polito's location. But plot twist! Polito's been dead the entire time and he's actually been communicating with Shodan. It may not be a welcome rug pull, but it certainly is a glorious and iconic one. Number 31. Joel's Death, The Last of Us Part 2 There were seven years between the release of The Last of Us and its sequel, and in that time, players were probably wondering what would become of Joel and Ellie. Would Joel have told Ellie the truth about what went down at the hospital? If so, would Ellie have been able to forgive him? We all had so many questions, though I think you'd have to scroll a long way through most people's list of queries before you got to, I wonder if Joel will get his head smashed in with a golf club. Alas, that's exactly what goes down just a couple of hours into the game. The Last of Us Part 2 is set four years after the event of the previous game, by which point a now grown-up Ellie is pretty gosh darn pissed off at Joel for what he did. Still in the zombie apocalypse, you've got to keep on keeping on, and whilst the pair's relationship is strained, they continue to live in the same community in Jackson, Wyoming. However, when Joel and Tommy fail to return from patrol, Ellie, her girlfriend Dina, and Dina's ex-boyfriend Jesse head out to look for them, and it's not long before Ellie discovers what has happened to her father figure. You see, the Firefly surgeon that Joel so thoughtlessly dispatched at the end of the first game just so happened to be the father of one of the group that he's taken shelter with, and they do not hesitate to show their displeasure. When Ellie arrives at Joel's location, she's immediately apprehended by his captors and is forced to watch on as Abby, the surgeon's daughter, beats Joel to death with a golf club in a truly heartbreaking and brutal scene. Number 30. The Long Ride Into Mexico – Red Dead Redemption Rockstar's Route in 2 in 2010 open-world title Red Dead Redemption is jam-packed with action, but it's actually one of its quieter moments that many players found to be the most memorable. Set in the year 1911, Red Dead Redemption sees former gang member John Marston forced to hunt down his old comrades by the American Bureau of Investigation, who have taken John's wife and son hostage and will only return them should he comply with their demands. Whilst on the trail of his former ally, Bill Williamson – well done to his parents for naming their son William Williamson, by the way – John winds up getting shot, but is taken in by local rancher Bonnie. Whilst on her farm, John formulates a plan to take down Williamson's gang at his stronghold, Fort Mercer. He rounds up a few men and they storm the fort, killing most of Williamson's men, but unfortunately, Williamson himself has fled to Mexico, and John is forced to take a long ride south. As John makes his way towards the border, Jose Gonzalez's Far Away begins to play. The song perfectly encapsulates the mood of the sequence, highlighting John's solitude as he rides towards an unfamiliar land with an unpleasant job to perform. For many players, this was the moment that Red Dead Redemption ceased to be just another video game and cemented itself as a cinematic masterpiece. Number 29. The Groom – Outlast Whistleblower 
The Outlast series is a veritable smorgasbord of nutty NPCs and grisly goings on. But the unsettling occurrence that has stuck with us all these years isn't even from either of the mainline stories from Outlast or Outlast 2, but instead from Whistleblower, the Outlast DLC. The additional content focuses on the eponymous Whistleblower, a software engineer working at Mount Massive Asylum by the name of Wayland Park. After witnessing the effects of the asylum's morphogenic engine on the facility's patients, he sends an anonymous email to Miles Upshaw, an investigative journalist and the protagonist of the main game. Sadly, he forgets to lock his laptop or something, because the bad folks at Mount Massive discover what he's done and have him detained. After breaking free of his restraints, Wayland sets out on a search for a shortwave radio that he can use to contact the authorities, but whilst wandering the halls of the asylum, he meets one or two unsavoury characters, including Eddie Gluskin, aka The Groom. Upon reaching the vocational block, Park is captured by Gluskin, a man obsessed with the idea of finding a perfect bride. You won't find this whack job on Tinder though, and let's just say that rather than accepting the parts his victims already have, he prefers to get creative with a knife. Certainly not an adversary we'll ever be able to forget. Number 28. The First Zombie – Resident Evil More Resident Evil now, as we fondly remember the first time that the series made us poop ourselves in terror. The original game in the Resident Evil franchise and its 2002 remake had plenty of moments to delight and spook in equal measure, and we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention the dogs bursting through the window or our first encounter with Lisa Trevor or the reveal that Wesker, the git, had been in on the whole affair the entire time. Those moments are absolutely ones that have stuck with us, but none of them holds a candle to the first time we clapped eyes on a zombie. Resident Evil was released in 1996 and tells the story of the Star's Alpha Team, who embark on a mission to investigate the disappearance of Bravo Team. After locating their crashed helicopter and being attacked by dogs, however, Alpha Team is forced to take shelter in the nearby Spencer Mansion. Unbeknownst to them, however, the whole place is crawling with T-Virus-infected monsters. Whilst playing as either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine, horror fans are introduced to the zombies when they find one snacking on Kenneth from Star's Bravo team. It doesn't remain focused on its meal for long though, and slowly turns to face the protagonist, giving them a vacant yet menacing stare. Ugh, utterly chilling. Number 27. Killing Hitler – Wolfenstein 2 – The New Colossus We've already talked about killing Mecha Hitler in our Wolfenstein 3D entry, but according to the good folks that contributed to this list, offing the world's most infamous dictator just once isn't enough. And so here's a second dose of genocidal bastard murder for good measure. Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus is set just five months after the end of Wolfenstein The New Order, and sees plucky all-American hero BJ Blazkowicz and pals attempting to free the United States from the tyranny of the Nazis. They find themselves some allies in the form of rebels Grace and Spech, who've been hiding out in the Empire State Building, destroy the Oberkommando in Roswell, New Mexico, and are able to rally a number of freedom fighters to their cause in New Orleans. Their final goal, however, is the trickiest – take control of the Ausmerzer, a huge fortified airborne platform used by the Nazis to maintain order in the US. In order to carry out their plan, they'll need the codes to deactivate its defenses which are, somewhat inconveniently, located on Venus. Not to worry though, because Hitler himself is looking for actors to play Blaskovich in a new film, and he just so happens to be located on Venus, which gives the real Blaskovich the perfect excuse to make his way over there. Whilst masquerading badly as an actor, Blaskovich is given the opportunity to stomp that evil mother flipper right in the face. Of course, doing so is a death sentence, but it's still an iconic moment. Besides, if you had the chance to kick Hitler to death, can you honestly say that you wouldn't? Number 26. Aunt May's Death – Marvel's Spider-Man if there's a scale for how sad we are about characters in video games dying, then I'm certain that Hitler and Aunt May would be at opposite ends of it. 
Released in 2018, originally as a PS4 exclusive, Marvel's Spider-Man skips over the whole origin story bit and puts players right into the midst of Peter Parker's hectic double life. The bulk of the game focuses on Spidey's attempts to thwart the plans of superhuman crime lord Mr. Negative, by definition the antithesis of Mr. Happy, who intends to seize control of New York's criminal underworld while simultaneously threatening to release a deadly virus, Devil's Breath, upon the city's population. Although Spidey does ultimately prevail, it's not all smiles and web-slinging along the way and a batch of Devil's Breath is released in Times Square by Dr. Octopus, causing a mass outbreak that infects a huge number of people, including Peter's own Aunt May. Ultimately, Spider-Man is able to get his hands on a small amount of the antidote, and winds up in a position where he must choose whether to use it on Aunt May or have it synthesized into a vaccine for all of the other victims. He of course chooses the latter, which is probably the right decision, though knowing that that doesn't make Aunt May's death any easier. Before she slips away, however, she tells Peter that she knows he's Spider-Man and that she's proud of him for it. Oh boy, I'm gonna need those tissues again. Number 25. You Died of Dysentery, The Oregon Trail We've got another quote for you now, and one that's so iconic that it's been memed into oblivion. We are of course talking about the infamous You Have Died of Dysentery line from 1985's The Oregon Trail. A reimagining of the 1971 text-based adventure of the same name, The Oregon Trail is an educational strategy title that was both developed and published by the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. The game is set in the year 1848, and the aim is to navigate a covered wagon from Independence, Missouri to Williamette Valley in Oregon along the titular Oregon Trail. Being the 1800s, however, this is no mean feat, and players must carefully choose what route to take, manage supplies, hunt for food, and of course, deal with disease, which was pretty rife in the 19th century. To give you an idea of how difficult the journey in the game is, it was the Oregon Trail which the real-life Donner Party used to make their way to California, and let's just say, things didn't go so well for them. The game ends when the player either gets the wagon all the way to Williamette Valley, or when all five members of their travelling party have died. The most memorable cause of death in the game was dysentery, a particularly nasty infection of the intestines whose main symptom is severe and bloody diarrhoea. If we've just put anyone off their lunch, then we sincerely apologise. Should players succumb to this grim illness, they'll be greeted with a screen that says, You have died of dysentery. Great, I always wanted to poop myself to death. Number 24. The Sinner's Sandwich – Deadly Premonition As we mentioned in a previous entry, we just love our food at Team Triple Jump, and we get really excited when a video game features a particularly delectable looking meal. This particular morsel was so intriguing, in fact, that we tried to recreate it ourselves, and I must say, I think we did a bang-up job. No? I don't think it's unfair to say that Deadly Premonition is a weird game, but whilst it didn't go down particularly well with critics, it has amassed itself something of a cult following in the years since its original release in 2010. Inspired heavily by early 90s TV series Twin Peaks, Deadly Premonition follows Francis York Morgan, an FBI special agent who is investigating the murder of an 18-year-old woman whose killing bears a number of similarities to other crimes committed across the country. During his investigations, York learns of a strange sandwich that's often ordered by one of the patrons of A&G Diner, Harry Stewart. The suspect snack is comprised of turkey, strawberry jam, and and breakfast cereal, a combination that York dubs the Sinner's Sandwich on account of the fact that he assumes Stuart must only eat it to atone for past sins. Ultimately though, York is convinced to give the mysterious morsel a try, and to his surprise, he finds that it's actually delicious. Turkey, jam, and cereal. <laughs> Who'd have thought it was a winning combination? I'm not going to have any more, but I didn't spit it out like I thought I would. Mm. Number 23. Receiving the Gravity Gun – Half-Life 2 
In the world of video games, you can barely move for iconic weapons, from Cloud Strife's Buster Sword to Sora's Keyblade. But if we had to choose just one to wish into reality, it would probably have to be the Gravity Gun. Now some of you might be wondering why we chose to include the receipt of the Gravity Gun on this list rather than that of the Portal Gun from Portal. And the answer is simple. Our rules dictate we can only have one entry per game, and we think that Portal has a far more unforgettable moment in its runtime than the one in which you get your hands on the Portal Gun itself. So don't worry, we'll get to that in a bit. Anyway, the Gravity Gun. Players first got to grips with this marvel of physics in 2004's Half-Life 2, the follow-up to 1998's Half-Life. The sequel sees bespectacled hunk Gordon Freeman facing off against the Combine, a multidimensional empire that was able to conquer Earth in just seven minutes after the Black Mesa incident attracted its attention. After joining the Resistance led by Dr. Eli Vance, Gordon heads to their base. Black Mesa East, where Alex, Vance's daughter, introduces Gordon to her pet robot, Dog, and more importantly, gives him the Gravity Gun, a firearm that can pick up objects and launch them at high speed. It would certainly be useful for taking out the bins, that's all I'm saying. Number 22. Cortana's Sacrifice, Halo 4. Many characters have come and gone from the Halo series, but one that most players assumed would be by Master Chief's side forever is Cortana, the benevolent AI that's been integral to so many of Chief's successes. Alas, it would seem that even artificial pals aren't safe from the jaws of death, as we all found out at the end of Halo 4. The game takes place in the distant future of 2557, and opens with Chief and Cortana drifting towards an unknown forerunner planet aboard the vessel Forward Unto Dawn, or, or at least half of it. After crash landing on the planet's interior, Chief unwittingly releases the Didact, an ancient forerunner warrior. And let me tell you now, that is not good news. The Didact believes mankind to be unworthy of the mantle of responsibility, and prior to his imprisonment, used a device known as the Composer to forcibly convert all of the troops under his command, as well as a number of humans, into the mechanical warriors, the Promethean Knights. Now newly freed, he's got his sights set on a new target, Earth. Although the Didact is able to trigger the Composer on one of the Halo installations, he isn't able to make it as far as Earth, thanks to Chief and a great big nuclear bomb. Upon its activation, however, Cortana saves Chief from the explosion, sacrificing herself in the process. Godspeed, Cortana. You are too good for this universe, anyway. Number 21. Rescuing Epona, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time of all the faithful animal companions we've encountered over the years, few are, in our minds at least, as iconic as Epona, Link's dutiful steed from the Legend of Zelda series, whom we first meet in 1998's Ocarina of Time. Link first comes across Epona at Lon Lon Ranch, where she's merely a foal, and although she's afraid of him at first, Link is able to tame her by using Epona's song, which is taught to him by the rancher's daughter, and after this, Epona takes a liking to Link. Following this encounter, it's seven whole years before Link and Epona are reunited. Though all is no longer well at the ranch, and Ingo, a grumpy man who was a worker there during Link's previous visit, is now in charge. Ingo intends to give the horse as a present to Ganondorf as a thank you for putting him in charge of the ranch. After playing Epona's song, the mare remembers Link, and he's able to ride her in a race against Ingo. Furious at Link's victory, Ingo bets Epona on the outcome of the next race, but when Link wins again, Ingo closes the gates of the ranch and refuses to let them leave. Link's a smart cookie, though, and is able to guide Epona out of the ranch to her freedom, securing himself a lifelong equine pal in the process. Aww. Number 20, deleting all of your save data. Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem. We spoke a little bit earlier about how some games like to break the fourth wall and mess with players. It's a little unnerving in Metal Gear Solid, but in 2002's Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem, it's downright terrifying. This GameCube exclusive horror title was the first M-rated game ever to be published by Nintendo, and sees players taking on the role of Alexandra Roivas, a woman who must channel her inner Poirot in order to serve the mystery of her grandfather's murder. I don't remember there being any human skin-bound tomes in Death on the 
the Nile, mind you. Gameplay-wise, Eternal Darkness was somewhat similar to Resident Evil in that players needed to fight off monsters and solve puzzles in order to further explore the game's various locations. Eternal Darkness was far from a Resident Evil clone, however, and whilst there were similarities in the gameplay, the former distinguished itself from other horror titles of the time by using a number of distinctive mechanics, including sanity effects. From the beginning of the game's second chapter, players must keep an eye on their sanity meter, which will deplete if they're spotted by an enemy. If it gets too low, the game will start messing with the player, slightly skewing the camera angle, subtly changing where statues are looking, or reciting passages from Hamlet. However, perhaps the most extreme, and by extension memorable, is the one that threatens to delete all of the player's save data from their console. All the Shakespeare and squiffy camera angles in the world couldn't induce the same level of fear as the thought of our progress on every GameCube title we had being lost doesn't bear thinking about. Number 19, Mordigan plunges the world into darkness, Dragon Quest XI. Although we hate it when baddies win overall, it is somewhat exciting when a villain's evil plans are partially pulled off. After all, a game, or any narrative-driven piece of media for that matter, isn't much fun if the protagonists win all the time. Take Dragon Quest XI for example. Sure, it would have been all sunshine and rainbows if the good guys had just been able to claim the Sword of Light and go on their merry way, but it would have been hecking boring for us players. The 11th entry into the long-running Dragon Quest series sees the player stepping into the shoes of an unnamed protagonist, who turns out to be a luminary, a legendary hero chosen by the world tree Idris and it's up to them to save the world of Adria from evil. After escaping imprisonment imposed by King Carnelian, the Luminary sets out on a quest to reach Idrisil, in the hopes of retrieving the Sword of Light, a weapon for which they are destined. Along the way, they gain a whole bunch of companions, and it all seems like it's going to plan. That is, of course, until King Carnelian, possessed by the evil sorcerer Mordigan, intercepts and subdues the party, which allows Mordigan to take the sword for himself, corrupt it, and plunge the world into an age of darkness. Even accounting for the severe lack of light, we did not see this one coming. Number 18, Joker's Death, Batman Arkham City. When we first played Batman Arkham City, all the way back in 2011, we expected a great many things. Tight latex outfits, increasingly ridiculous supervillains, and endless parades of dispensable goons were all things we presumed we'd see. What we didn't anticipate, however, was the death of the Batman's most iconic villain. Whilst Hugo Strange is bopping about, trying to execute one of the dumbest evil plans we've ever come across in video games, the Joker is also up to no good, and poisons Batman with Titan-infused blood, whose effects he himself is also dealing with, which he happens to have sent out to every hospital in Gotham. That scamp. With the help of Mr. Freeze, old Brucey Dub is able to find a cure for what ails him and his foe, and sets out to deal with the Joker, who appears to have made a miraculous recovery. Upon his arrival at the Monarch Theatre though, Bats finds out that Joker is nearing death, and has actually been using Clayface as a stand-in. Following a tense battle with the latter, during which Raish al Ghul's key to resurrection, the Lazarus Pit, is destroyed, Batman is able to take part of the cure, saving himself. However, as he debates curing the Joker, the villain attacks him, inadvertently smashing the antidote in the process. Batman admits that he would have spared Joker despite everything, and the clown prince of crime succumbs to his illness and dies. Play stupid blood diseasey games, win stupid blood diseasey prizes, I suppose. Number 17, The Plane Crash, Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception. Now, don't get us wrong, we love Nathan Drake, but it is starting to feel a bit like wherever he goes, destruction ensues. All I'm saying is, you wouldn't want to invite the man round to look at your collection of Ming vases or Fabergé eggs. Chaos continues to follow Drake in the second Uncharted sequel, Drake's Deception. The game takes place some two years after the previous one, and begins with Nate and Sully meeting a man named Talbot in London, who is looking to purchase Nate's ring. Sadly, it's no deal for Talbot, when the pair accuse him of using counterfeit money and a scuffle ensues in which both Nate and Sully are subdued and the ring is stolen by Talbot's employer, Catherine Marlowe. Looks like we've got ourselves a treasure hunt, eh boys? The hunt for Marlowe takes Nate and Sully to Yemen, where the latter is captured, and whilst in pursuit of his friend, Nate makes his way aboard a cargo plane bound for Marlowe's convoy, which results in one of the most exciting and nail-biting sequences in the series. It's not long before one of Marlowe's henchmen discovers Nate, and he's almost killed when he jettisons its cargo. This 
This is Nathan Drake though, and he's not about to let a little thing like almost falling out of a plane stop him. He's able to climb back on board, but is then almost killed again when the plane is destroyed in a firefight. Jeez, you really can't take him anywhere. Number 16, the first Xenomorph encounter, Alien Isolation. In 2013, Aliens Colonial Marines achieved a feat that was thought to be impossible. It made the Xenomorphs unscary. We players were left to wonder if the sci-fi monsters would ever be able to terrify us again, though thankfully, we didn't have to wonder for very long, as in 2014, Alien Isolation burst onto the scene, though thankfully not through anyone's chest, and confirmed unequivocally that the Xenomorphs still had the power to make us soil ourselves. Alien Isolation takes place 15 years after the events of the first Alien movie, and follows Amanda Ripley, the daughter of film series protagonist Ellen Ripley, as she investigates the disappearance of her mother aboard the Sevastopol space station. Upon arrival, however, she finds the whole place has fallen into disarray thanks to a xenomorph that's on the loose. Unlike Colonial Marines, Alien Isolation's gameplay is more stealth-focused, so players know, going into proceedings, that the alien creature is best avoided, and they need to be constantly looking out for hiding spots. Still, when it actually comes to it, there's nothing that can prepare you for your first encounter with the Xenomorph, because regardless of how confident you are in your stealthing abilities, that thing looks and sounds bloody terrifying. Is… is it gone yet? Number 15. Hey you, you're finally awake. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Yet another game that's packed to the gills with memorable moments is Bethesda's open world fantasy RPG, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. So much so that we had a tough time choosing just one for this list. We must give an honourable mention to Alduin's attack on the Imperial Outpost, the first time we got to fuss Rodar something, or someone, and of course, being yeeted skyward after getting a little too close to a giant. The pick of several members of our community, however, occurs within the first minute of the game's runtime. Skyrim opens with the player character on the back of a horse-drawn cart, being transported to an Imperial Outpost to be executed alongside Ulfric Stormcloak, the Jarl of Windhelm, who leads a rebellion against Imperial rule. Through conversations with the men on the cart, we learn the player character isn't actually anything to do with the rebellion, and simply got caught in an Imperial ambush whilst trying to cross the border. There wouldn't be much of a game if the protagonist is immediately executed though, and thankfully, Alduin the World Eater is on hand to inadvertently secure freedom for the player and the Stormcloaks. Before all of this kicks off though, the player is met with a simple, yet now iconic greeting. Hey, you finally awake. To the uninitiated, the words may not sound particularly rousing, but for fans of the game, they mark the beginning of a truly epic adventure. Number 14, Nuking Megaton, Fallout 3. I'm beginning to think we need to have some sort of intervention with our community, as this is the second suggestion for an iconic moment in gaming that involves a nuclear bomb. Are you all okay? Do you need me to call someone? Set in the year 2277, some two centuries after nuclear war has devastated the world, Fallout 3 sees players traversing the desolate landscape as the Lone Wanderer, who has spent the first 19 years of their life in the confines of Vault 101, but who escapes in order to try and track down their father, James. No not that one. Their search begins in the nearby town of Megaton, which is named for the undetonated nuclear bomb that slapped bang in the centre of it. Most of the townspeople believe the bomb to be inert, but as demonstrated later on in the game, it's very much live and very much capable of levelling the place. In the quest The Power of the Atom, Sheriff Lucas Sims tasks the lone wanderer with disarming the bomb in order to remove its threat from the town. Mr Burke, however, wishes for the bomb to be detonated, as his employer considers Megaton to be a blight on the landscape. Defusing the bomb is obviously the right thing to do, but detonating the nuke results in a bigger payday. If you do go with the latter option, then you'd better hope you can use some of those caps to get all that blood off your hands. Number 13, Tiny Tina comes to terms with Roland's death, Tiny Tina's assault on Dragon Keep. Now before anyone gets up in our grill, we know that we said we'd only be including one entry per game, and that technically, this moment is another from Borderlands 2, but although Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep was just a DLC for quite a while, it got a standalone release in 2021. Therefore, we think it adheres to the rules. If you disagree, please feel free to write your own list. Character deaths can be pretty hard to come to terms with for us players, so just imagine how tough it must be for the in-game folks that are left behind. 
behind. On the surface of it, Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep looks like a fun little adventure in which our favourite vault hunters get the opportunity to play a bit of bunkers and badasses, a tabletop role-playing game that bears more than a passing resemblance to Dungeons and Dragons. If you've played it though, you'll know that, at its heart, Assault on Dragon Keep is a story of a girl who is desperately trying to come to terms with the loss of her friend, and who is just trying to cope in the only way she knows how. The whole scenario comes to an utterly heart-rending head following the defeat of the handsome sorcerer. As the antagonist falls, Bunker Master Tina announces that everyone's favourite invincible knight Roland has showed up to celebrate. The Vault Hunters remind Tina that Roland is dead, and tell her that she needs to accept it, causing the poor girl to break down, finally acknowledging the loss. The scene is devastating, but also heartwarming, as Tina's friends rally around and encourage her to tell the story in whatever way she likes. Gosh, how many more of these sad entries are we going to have? I don't think I can take much more. Number 12, By the Book, Grand Theft Auto 5. The Grand Theft Auto franchise has been upsetting politicians, special interest groups, and oversensitive parents ever since the first entry into the series was released in 1997. Whilst there is plenty of science to dispel the myth that video games cause violent behaviour in players, Rockstar doesn't exactly endear itself to the various concerned parties by creating missions like By the Book, which can be found in GTA V. Don't get us wrong, we're all for freedom of expression and whatnot, but there really is no wonder that the most delicate members of our society get a bit upset with the studio every time they release a new game. If you're unfamiliar with Grand Theft Auto V, then firstly, congratulations on finally emerging from your underground bunker in which I assume you've been living in for the past decade. And secondly, allow me to explain the premise. The fourth numbered, or rather Roman numeraled, sequel in Rockstar's steely wheelie automobile franchise centres on protagonists Michael Franklin and Trevor, three criminals of varying flavours, as they attempt to undertake several heists, all while dealing with other crims and a corrupt government agency. Alas, it turns out, the GTA V's most memorable moment is also its most controversial. During the mission by the book, Trevor is tasked with extracting information from Ferdinand Kerimov about an individual with potential links to terrorist activities. Does he buy the guy a few drinks and hope to loosen his tongue that way? No, of course not! He tortures the man until he gives up the information. Don't get us wrong, we're not exactly squeamish, but we do feel a bit bad about having to waterboard a bloke, no matter what he does know. Certainly not a sequence we're in a hurry to recall, though one that's pretty hard to forget. Number 11, the companions are other players, Journey. 2012's Journey is one of those games that needs to be played to be fully appreciated, and no amount of praise from us, or any other outlet for that matter, could ever do it justice. Developed by that game company and published by Sony Computer Entertainment, Journey sees players making their way across a vast desert in order to reach a distant mountain. Across multiple levels, players control a robed, silent figure capable of flight thanks to a magical scarf, which must be recharged every so often by coming into close proximity with the pieces of red cloth that are dotted about. There's no dialogue in the game, and players must instead interpret the story from the gameplay and what they see in the cutscenes. Along the way, the robed figure will encounter other characters who can assist him, though their only means of communication is a simple chime which can turn a dull piece of cloth into a vibrant red one, thus allowing them to charge their scarf. Despite never saying a word to those they encountered, many players found that they built an emotional connection with them, one that was all the more heartwarming when they found out these characters weren't NPCs, but were in fact other players. At the end of the game, Journey gives the names of those that have helped the player, revealing that their seemingly solitary experience has actually been shared with many others, and cementing their time with the game in their memories forever. Number 10. D-Day Landing, Medal of Honor Frontline. Under normal circumstances, we British folk here at Team Triple Jump would be absolutely fuming at the spelling of the word honour in the title of this entry, but you know what? We're in a good mood, so we'll let it slide just this once. Next time though, Medal of Onor, we want to see that U where it belongs. You hear me? Like his three predecessors, Medal of Honor Frontline is a game of the World War II first-person shooter persuasion. Players take on the role of Lieutenant James Stephen Jimmy Patterson and join him in his journey as he fights his way across Europe and into Nazi Germany. There's no basic training here though, and players are thrown straight in at the deep end, quite literally. It's June the 6th, 1944, and Jimmy Patterson is one of the thousands of soldiers storming Omaha Beach. Like his comrades, he approaches the beach by boat, which stops several metres short of the shore, and after 
after swimming to dry land, he's faced with a tense, terrifying battle against the Axis forces. The opening level of Medal of Honor Frontline is complete chaos and gives players a harrowing glimpse of the horrors of war. It is by no means an easy sequence to play through, but it's a spectacular opening to a fantastic game, and there's little wonder that it's stuck with players for the past 20 years. Number 9. Did I ever tell you what the definition of insanity is? Far Cry 3. Far Cry 3 features one of the finest villains in video game history, the utterly unhinged Vas Montenegro. But of all of the cruel and sadistic things he does throughout the game's runtime, it's his crazed monologue regarding the definition of insanity that makes our list today. This 2012 Ubisoft FPS is the third mainline installment in the Far Cry series, and sees protagonist Jason Brody and his friends landing, somewhat literally, into some serious trouble when they accidentally parachute onto an island that's overrun by pirates. What? Oops. The group is immediately captured by Vas Montenegro and Chums, who intend to sell them all into slavery, and though Jason is able to escape, his brother Grant is not so lucky and is killed by Vaz. Following his brush with the pirates, Jason is initiated into the Rakyat tribe, who are native to the island, and with their help and that of CIA agent Willis Huntley, he sets out to reclaim the island for the tribe's people. Along the way, Jason has several more brushes with Vaas, including one in which Vaas attempts to drown him after monologuing about the definition of insanity, which he claims is doing the exact same flipping thing over and over again and expecting stuff to change. I am paraphrasing slightly, of course. The moment is iconic and endlessly quoted by fans of the game, and the real definition of insanity would not be including it on this list. Number 8. You Died. Soulsborne series. What's this? A wildcard entry on a big list? Well, knock me over with a feather. Indeed, although this is an occurrence that happens multiple times throughout the Soulsborne series, or at least it is if you're as rubbish at them as our writer, we didn't feel that we could get away with compiling a list of the most unforgettable moments in gaming without giving a nod to the most iconic game over message out there. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past dozen or so years, you'll know that the Soulsborne series is comprised of some of the most challenging games known to mankind. Demon Souls, all three Dark Souls titles, and Bloodborne are known the world over for presenting players with enemies and bosses that often take multiple attempts to best and are responsible for the destruction of countless controllers that players have thrown to the floor in a fit of rage. If you've played any of the Soulsborne games, you'll know exactly how frustrating it is to repeatedly have the words, you died, flash up on screen, though equally you'll know just how satisfying it is to beat an enemy that's given you tons of grief. Regardless, it's an unforgettable gaming motif and one that forever serves as a reminder that you just need to get good. Number 7. The Dog Returns – Resident Evil 4 Yes, yes, we know, there's been a lot of Resident Evil on this list, but we swear this is the last one. I don't know why you're so mad about it. It's not our fault the venerable horror franchise has had so many iconic moments throughout its multiple decades spanning history. Resident Evil 4, which was released in 2005, follows Leon S. Kennedy, now a government special agent, as he travels to a small village in Spain in order to track down the president's kidnapped daughter, Ashley. Before all of that really kicks off, though, players have the opportunity to help a K nine in need. Shortly after embarking on his mission, Leon encounters a dog with its legs stuck in a bear trap. Cold-hearted players might ignore the pup, but doing so is a big mistake. Not only because you're leaving a poor defenseless animal to die in a horrible way, but also because the dog makes a triumphant return later in the game. Whilst Leon is fighting the first El Gigante, a bioweapon that very much lives up to its name, the rescued dog makes its grand reappearance, and distracts El Gigante so Leon can get in a few decent shots. The dog is thankfully unharmed, though it doesn't make another appearance for the rest of the game. Still, we'll never forget the bravery displayed by that courageous canine in our hour of need. We salute you, dear doggo. Number 6. Stepping Out of the Sleep Chamber – The Legend of Zelda – Breath of the Wild The Legend of Zelda – Breath of the Wild is undeniably one of the finest games ever made, and from the second that players boot up the title, they know they're witnessing something truly special. Breath of the Wild takes place at the very end of the somewhat confusing Legend of Zelda timeline. A century prior to the events of the game, Calamity Ganon possessed the Ancient Guardians and the Divine Beasts, who up until that point had been the protectors of Hyrule. Whilst protecting the Princess Zelda, Link was gravely wounded, and was placed by the princess into a healing chamber to allow him time to recover. 
Some 100 years later, Link finally awakens and sets out on a quest to recover his lost memories and defeat Calamity Ganon once and for all. It was this moment, the one in which Link wakes up and steps out of the sleep chamber, that many of you chose as the most memorable one of the entire game. We can't say we're surprised. After all, the opening few minutes of the game are not only visually stunning, but they're also packed to the gills with mystery and intrigue. What is this place? Why is Link here? And if he's been asleep in a pool of water, why isn't his skin all wrinkly? Number 5. Vader – Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order when it comes to villains, there are few more iconic than Darth Vader, and by golly does he know how to make an entrance. Sadly, the heavy breathing lad doesn't get a great deal of screen time in 2019's Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, though what bit he does have, he makes good use of. The game takes place five years after the events of Revenge of the Sith, by which time any Jedi not killed during Order 66 have gone into hiding, hunted by Imperial Inquisitors. The protagonist is Cal Kestis, a former Jedi Padawan now working as a scrapper on the planet Bracca, who winds up entangled in a plot to rebuild the Jedi Order after revealing his Force powers while saving a friend. Cal, along with Jedi Knight, Seer, Pilot, Grease, and adorable robot BD-1, set out on a mission to unlock an ancient vault which conceals a holocron containing a list of the names of Force-sensitive children. If found, it will allow them to re-establish the Fallen Order. Huh, oh, like, like in the title. Ultimately, they make it to the vault, but are confronted by Seer's former Padawan, Trilla, who has now become an Inquisitor. Cal and Trilla engage in a bitter lightsaber battle, after which she and Seer briefly reconcile. Ah, oh, very sweet. Do you know who doesn't think it's sweet, though? Darth Vader! Just as Trilla admits how much hate she's carried for Seer, the villain's iconic breathing can be heard approaching, and sensing betrayal, he swiftly dispatches Trilla as Cal and Seer look on in horror. That's certainly one way to make your presence known. You would be wise to surrender. Yeah. Probably. Number 4. The Baby in the Sink, P.T. P.T., the playable teaser for Hideo Kojima's cancelled spook fest Silent Hills, was one of the scariest horror experiences in all of gaming, which is really something considering it was only a demo. Released in 2014 exclusively on PlayStation 4, P.T. gave players a brief glimpse at what Silent Hills would have been. Had Kojima and Konami not had a massive falling out, they resulted, among other things, in the game's cancellation. Still, at least we have P.T. You know, as long as you've got a PlayStation 4 with it already downloaded, because Konami removed it from the PlayStation Store after the big breakup. Yes, we are still bitter about all of this. What gave it away? The teaser focuses on an unnamed protagonist who awakens in a room that links to a corridor that, when walked, continuously loops. The overall aim is to investigate the house, solve the puzzles, and escape. Though all of that is easier said than done when you're hiding behind a sofa cushion. Of all of the frightening scenes in PT, however, one of the most memorable is the bloodied and disfigured baby in the sink. We're not sure what we were expecting to find when that bathroom door flew open for the first time, but a deformed, eyeless, chicken-looking thing definitely wasn't it. Is anyone missing a sink, baby? Number 3. No Russian. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 We've got one final dose of controversy for you now, as we take a look at Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, a best-selling first-person shooter that upset a lot of people when it released in 2009. Though the game received criticism for everything from homophobic to racially insensitive content, it was the level, no Russian, that drew the vast majority of the ire. In the sequence, players take on the role of an undercover CIA agent who seeks to gain the trust of a Russian terrorist group, but in order to do this, they must participate in an attack on an airport in Moscow. The level begins with the player character, Joseph Allen, in an elevator alongside antagonist Vladimir Makarov and three other gunmen. Makarov tells the men, remember, no Russian, to remind them to speak only English English in order to frame the attack as being orchestrated by Americans, after which they leave the elevator and open fire on a civilian crowd. Players can choose whether or not to participate in the violence, and can even skip the level altogether if they so wish, but it's still a sequence that seriously upset a number of people. There were multiple calls for the game to be banned as a result of the level, and it was subject to heavy censorship in several different countries. Still, at least Makarov gets his wish, we'll absolutely remember No Russian for many years to come. 
Number two, euthanizing your companion cube, Portal. We've talked about death a lot throughout this list, but although every one of these losses thus far has left its mark, none has affected us quite as deeply as the euthanization of our dear, sweet companion cube in 2007's Portal. Yes, that's right, the video game character death that hurt us the most wasn't even really a character death at all, but was, effectively, the disposal of an inanimate object. And you know what? We're not even going to apologize. The companion cube is a crate-sized grey box with a little heart on each side that was purposely designed by developer Valve to look as vulnerable as possible so the players felt the need to take care of it. And what a great job they did, because oh boy, do gamers love that little cube. It's first given to protagonist Chell in Test Chamber 17 by antagonist GLaDOS, who proceeds to anthropomorphize the cube in an attempt to get Chell, and by extension the player, to bond with it. This works. After we've carried it through the entire level and grown somewhat attached to our little cuboid pal, GLaDOS forces Chell to euthanize the cube. Sadly, no matter what the player does, there's no getting around it. The companion cube must be thrown into the incinerator in order to proceed. Why am I crying over a stupid grey box? Number 1. Would You Kindly Bioshock now, I know we said right at the beginning of this video that these entries were in no particular order, but this moment was suggested by more members of our community than any other, and so even though this isn't a ranked list, it would have been a disservice to place it anywhere but the number one spot. Also, we know that many of you will have forgotten about the no particular order thing by now and will have already gone off in the comments because we've placed your favourite moment so far down on our list. It's fine, we forgive you, but you know, we did, we did warn you. Released in 2007, Bioshock gave gamers perhaps the most iconic plot twist in all of video game history. The game begins in the year 1960, when protagonist Jack's plane crashes into the Atlantic Ocean, leaving none but him alive. Thankfully, a lighthouse is nearby, and he's able to make his way inside where he discovers a bathysphere, which takes him deep below the surface to the underwater city of Rapture. Upon his arrival, Jack is contacted by the friendly-sounding Irishman Atlas, who encourages Jack to explore the city and confront its founder, Andrew Ryan, whom Atlas claims has taken his wife and child hostage. Except, it transpires that Atlas is, in fact, Frank Fontaine, Ryan's arch-rival, and that Jack has been brainwashed to respond to the phrase, would you kindly, which has preceded all of Atlas's demands, with blind obedience. It's perhaps the most memorable twist in all of gaming, and is thoroughly deserving of the top spot on this list, even though the top spot carries no more significance than any other. Would you kindly remember that for next time? 